Good evening and welcome to Poker Night Live, the show that brings you live online poker seven nights a week. Tonight is a Dr. Tom Nightner special. That, of course, is me, Michelle, and our resident expert, Dr. Tom Sandbrook. Doctor of poker, that is. Uh, how are you, Michelle? I'm not bad, how are you? I love the new haircut. Thank you for noticing. Yeah, they you didn't me. notice last time <laughs> that we worked together and I, had, and I had it cut, but never mind. Well, I try. Um, well, Tom is our expert for the evening. What's going to happen? We're going to watch live internet games as they're being played and by real people with real cash. There is a delay, um, so our players can't put the telly on and see each other's cards. Um, but we will learn how to play the game of Texas Hold'em poker. Now, if you have any questions throughout the night, Tom here will be doing a commentary of all that we see. If you don't understand anything or you'd like to ask any questions about poker or anything in particular, do get in contact with us. The text number is 84222. And text the word poker and your question. It's only four for a pound. But that is exceptionally good value, Michelle. It's very good value, isn't it? And you can also email poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. And do remember to visit us on the World Wide Web, pokernightlive.co.uk. There's a forum up there as well, so you can have a chat um, about particular subjects to do with poker. Very, very good. Now, tonight we're going to be watching tournaments, um, our usual multi-table tournament and some sitting goes as well. Um, Tom, if you wouldn't mind whizzing us around the poker matrix. Let's have a look at what the matrix offers us tonight. Well, it's a $5 sitting go on table one. Here it comes. I can fill it in the waters. One player out. And this is one of the super long structure Sit in the goes, 12 hands before the blinds go up. And they sit in the go. 2,000 chips, sit in the go, pick the mix. <laughs> That's right, fish and the chips. <laughs> there it is. And table two is a $10 sit in the go. And this looks like uh, also one of the long structure games, 2,000 starting chips, top and iron. Now, the uh, 25 cent, 50 cent cash game. Uh, as we are wanting to see on Poker Night Live, is here on table three. <laughs> Snap it, John Boy Rebel. These guys should be on the salary, really. They're always here, aren't they? They are. They love it. And great cash game last night. And we hope they've not been disappointed tonight. And finally, onto the green. Here it is, the MTT. 99 entrants in this one. And 92 of them left. Blinds at second level, 15.30. So we're going to be watching that, so coming back to that throughout the night, but mainly we're going to catch it at the end for the thrilling final table where you need to learn and can learn all the secrets of final table excellence. Lovely. Excellent. Well, um, tonight I think we're going to maybe concentrate on bluffs. Oh, are we? Tom. Well, right. everybody knows that bluffing is a part of poker. It's not as huge a part as people think, is That's it? That's right, no. Um, I think it might be a good idea to maybe concentrate on bluffs. Let's have a look at the bluffs people are making and whether you think they're good bluffs at good times. Yeah, let's have, what we'll do, Michelle, mm -hmm. is that every time someone bluffs, we'll write it down and we'll see how much bluffing goes on. Because I'll be You're quite going interested. to write it down, are you? Well, we'll get some <laughs> lackey to do, I don't know. Someone at home, maybe you can email us. But we'll pay attention to what the frequency of bluffing is. Because I reckon it's probably down around 10%. Yeah, OK. Mm. Just bear in mind this is all off, off the cuff here. This is wonderful stuff. Yeah, we're going to have to get poker about viewing. 20 minutes. So do remind us halfway through the show. And we need you to get involved um, with that subject as well. Let us know what's the best bluff you've ever done. When have you felt the best when you've made a bluff? And have you done it in a live game on the internet? Could you do it in a live game? Has anyone ever bluffed you um, and shown you? Let us know your stories on that text, 84222, and the email poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. Yeah, we are talking about bluffs in poker here, not bluffing your girlfriend about where you were last night. Although I would be quite interested in this. <laughs> you need some tips. <laughs> so how have you been anyway? Have you been playing much? Uh, I've been uh, doing a bit of seven card stunt, you know. Ooh, Trying to different. branch out a bit. Because in the long run, people are saying now the, the World Championship in poker in a few years' time will not be established by Texas Hold'em, but by this horse event where you play five different games. And that may be the way things are going. So if I'm ever going to be a World Champion, I want to be a few, few years ahead of the game. Ah, so maybe we should start playing Texas Hold'em and some, some new... Well, it might be in the pipeline. Watch this space. Ah, excellent. Well, tonight, what do you fancy starting off with? Well, let's do some Texas Hold'em, because that's all we've got. <laughs> Texas Hold'em, because that's all we've got, right. Well, we're going to start off with our multi-table tournament, as usual, so let's have a look over there and see what's going on. 
Yeah, what is going on? Well... Any bluffs? Well, we've, what, in the split second that we've been here? Well, I'm, I'm hungry for them. Oh, well, look, we've got two, three, four, five for Quink, so mm. he hasn't quite got his straight. No. But he does have a pair of fives. Yes, he does. But Munster storming ahead with two pair, queens and eights. Oh, it's paid off. Who's this Quink guy? He's a philanthropist, that's what he is. So, multi-table tournament started off with 99 players. Um, it's a standard $10 multi-table tournament. Um, they do have to play a dollar to the house, so <laughs> they'd all play, play, pay $11. So there's not 13 tables with 99 entrants. The blinds rise every 12 minutes. And the top 10 places are, pay are paid. Can't talk to Is this going to go on all night? <laughs> what time is it? Maybe we should sort you out and I'll take you. <laughs> What's first prize? Supplies? <laughs> it's very funny. Um, $297. Wow, not bad for a $10 uh, spin up. And tenth is $14. So what is this multi-table tournament we're watching, Doc? What is it? Well, it's Texas Hold'em. It's no limit Texas Hold'em, the game we know and love. But because uh, it's a multi-table format, it means that we're seeing here just one of uh, 13 tables. Um, they all put in their entry fee, $10. Got some tournament chips, 1500 I believe. And uh, they can't cash those chips in. They have no monetary value. Are you yawning? <laughs> no, you were yawning. I? Would I be yawning while you're talking? I'm sorry if it's not spicy <laughs> enough for you, Michelle. Would I, could I yawn while you're talking, Doc? Well, where was I? Oh, I don't know. Put me off my, my thread now. <laughs> Basically, you've got to get in the money, and it's a game of stamina, a bit like presenting Poker Night Live. You're in a cheeky mood tonight, So aren't you've you, Doc? got to be in the top ten to get paid. Isn't that right, Michelle? Yes. So they're all, they were all awarded 1,000 chips. Isn't it 1,500? 1,500. Is it? You tell me. You're the expert. I don't know. I wasn't here at the start. OK, they've all been awarded. Let's have a look. 1,500 chips. It does look like it was 1,500. It's because I saw three lower stacks. So all been awarded 1,500 chips for their $10. And it's to the death competitions. Once their chips have gone, they're out. And as people are knocked out, the tables are condensed until we reach our final table later on this evening. Mm. How do they condense the tables? Well, it's all done by the computer, isn't it? Mm. So I'm assuming, tell me if this is right, Doc, that they try and take people from the table and put them on another table to do with the blinds, mm -hmm. to make it fair as possible. Well, it's interesting there. I mean, what they're definitely doing is that they're trying to keep the tables as balanced as possible. So if you've got, say, you've got a load of tables with eight at, at them and then you've got one with nine and one with seven, they'll shift someone from the nine table to the seven table to make them all eight, for example. But the way in which they do that um, varies certainly from, from real card room to real card room. Often it's the guy who's going to be the next big blind who gets moved, which is kind of fairest because otherwise they could be moving from, say, a position... That, yawning again. <laughs> Tom, do, Tom. do email the show if you find this interesting because I'd like a bit of backup here. <laughs> Can I just say, he is lying. He's just trying to be funny. But uh, on the internet, I'm often moved from all sorts of strange places on the table to uh, all sorts of other strange places. So I don't know quite what algorithm they use. I think it should be completely random. I think even in a real card room, it, it makes no sense to preferentially move the guy who's going to be the big blind, because that just um, increases the uh, fortunes of the small stacks, because that doesn't make much difference if you're the big stack, but if you're the small stack, it makes a big difference. So you're favouring the small stacks over the big ones, and that necessarily moves the tournament back to a random state, because on average, the smaller stacks are going to be the worst players than the big stacks. Well, here's Ace-5 coming in. A rather loose call, in my opinion. And two players make a flush draw. And Bad Angle got the gut shot draw, but it's not a great draw because there's okay, only let's, four um, cards. And as it's amateur night, can you just explain what you're talking about there? Flush draws and gut shot flush draws and all sorts of poker jargon that's coming out of the mouth. All right, I'll do my best, Michelle. Thank you very much. A flush draw is when you're going to make a flush if another card comes of that suit, for example, a diamond. Which you just did. Yep. Ooh. Ooh, very interesting. Saucy. So everyone's got a flush if they're in, but uh, it will be decided by the guy with the biggest flush, and that's poker, because he's got ace of diamonds in his hand. He's been paid off. Nice pot, nice pot. And the gut shot draw is when you're trying to make a straight, five cards in a row, but you've got to hit one particular card in the middle. 
That's what Bad Angle had, but he knew it wasn't much good with all those diamonds out there. He could hit it straight and still lose to a flush. So he's limped in again rather than raising Bad Angle. Hasn't quite got the hang of aggressive play here. And he's caught the flush draw that we were talking about there. On this occasion, he's the only one with it, which is where you want to be. So he's going to be needing another spade. Hmm. Meanwhile, Munster with a middle, or rather with the bottom pair there, fives. Can't really bet this. I wouldn't. I'd be prepared to let it go if someone said boo to me. But he's decided to uh, bet what is indeed the best hand, so good luck to him. He's charging bad angle a price to draw to that flush, which is good poker. Hey, hey, I said he hadn't discovered aggressive play. How wrong I was. Bad angle there. That's a semi-bluff. I'm going to write that down, Michelle. That was a semi-bluff. Semi-bluff. He did have outs because he could have hit his draw. That's right. Oh, his coin gets a pair of kings. OK, so we're at the very first stage of this. No, we're not. We're at second stage. First stage was 10.20. Um, every 12 minutes, the blinds raise. Now they are 15.30. And we can see that poker mate is on the big blind at 30 and has called the raise. Oh, what a nutter. Um, he doesn't have a good hand. No, he doesn't. So it seems very odd that he's decided to pay 150 chips to see a flop. You're not wrong, Michelle. It was a big price to pay, wasn't it? Lucky flop for Excellis. Wow. This is awful for Quink, because it's... Uh, although, saying that, there is an ace. So he, uh, the, the ace will hopefully save Quink here. And how's that, Michelle? Um, because he can think if Excellis made a raise, pre-flop, it's likely that he's got an ace in his hand or high cards in his hand. Um, so now that the ace has hit and he's still betting, the I think he can quite easily be scared of that and think that Excellis does indeed have an ace. We can see he doesn't, but we can see he's got two pair. Yeah. So the ace will hopefully save uh, Quink. But unfortunately, it's not going to, because Excellis is going to be all in here, I assume. I think that's a terrible raise in the river, because of what you said. Michelle, there's an ace there. Quink doesn't need to bluff there if he's ahead, and if he's behind, he's not going to push his opponent off with a bet of 250. Oh, he paid about? him off. Oh, shocking play. So we didn't like that from Quink. All the information was there. Now, remember, you're on the internet. You can't see people, so you use the betting. As, um, the bet all the betting patterns give you your information. And if, if you've got a pair of kings, it's a wonderful hand, but it is still just a pair. And a, an ace, any ace in somebody's hand is beating you. And Excelis was telling Quink the whole hand that he had something, and Quink just wasn't listening. That's right, yeah. And, and to be honest, it, what, what's key there is that Quink wasn't going to get paid. Excelis would fold any hand that was worse than the kings. This is very aggressive play from Golden Jaguar, and he's got himself in with the worst of it, but he's made a flush. Very fortunate, very fortunate indeed, and no one's going to respect his raises under the gun throughout this tournament there. Four times the big blind with uh, Queen 10 suited, and he was happy to move all in with it. And I'm not going to count pre-flop uh, bets as bluffs here, Michelle, because, okay. I mean, anything can happen with five cards to come. So we're talking all post-flop bluffing. Do remember to get your bluff stories into us, 84222, on the text and poker at pokernightlive.co.uk on the email. We want to hear about your bluffy stories, please. And we're going to have a look at how many people use the bluff in the game. Now, Golden Jaguar here does have the ace. We can see that's enough to beat Excellus. But he's a very raggy ace, so he needs to be slightly aware that Excellus could have a better ace than him. Mm. But he's just got his answer by re-raising. Mm -hmm. He's on a roll, this boy. I'm sure he's not going to stop with the massive hand, ace-10, but he might be brought up in his tracks here by Coink, who's uh, looking to get revenge for his debacle with the Kings. Oh, he's putting a little mini raise there. Interesting. Personally, I call or I raise properly there, because I feel that... That kind of is the worst of both worlds. It alerts your opponents to the fact you've got some sort of hand, but it doesn't really build the pot. Well, look at that. Ooh, this is wonderful for Quink. What is Munster on? These boys, are, they've had too much Red Bull. Well, a four. I would give it to Munster, but it doesn't come. So he's gone. He's gone, yeah, Munster's gone. Quink's back. 84 players left. So if it's moving it a bit quick for you, don't worry. Um, the same thing happens each hand. 
You can see the, the blinds there, 25 and 50 on Excellus and Bam Bangle. They're in there automatically to create play and create a pot, something to fight for. But Chaos Legion has chosen to raise, and so Bad Angle has to call uh, the difference between his big blind and Chaos Legion's 100 in order to carry on. And again, here on the flop, if he wants to carry on, he's got to call the 100 that Chaos has bet, but he's not prepared to call with the hand he has. And that is how you can bluff in poker. You don't have to have the best hand. All you've got to do is to put in a bet that your opponents aren't prepared to call. That's what a bluff is. So you need to work out what you think they've got. Mm -hmm. And also you have to think about what you think they think you could have. Indeed. And using the information that you, you have, you then decide whether it's a good thing to make your bluff or not. Yeah, that's, that's a very important point you make there, the second one. You've got to credibly have a hand yourself, unless you're up against someone who's absolutely got no backbone whatsoever. So you never need to completely bluff then? Is, is there no situation where you would bluff with absolutely nothing? Oh, or would yeah. you just not get involved? Is yeah, it no, best sure. not to get involved? If you're up against a complete wimp, yeah. you, you just don't have to have anything. In fact, even if he's going to call you some of the time, as long as he calls you falls more often than he calls, and you put in a pot-sized bet, you're going to make a profit doing that. Okay. And every now and then you'll find yourself in a situation where you've got a, an opponent who really is a coward, or you'll find yourself in a situation where you know he doesn't have a hand, and there's a massive hand that could be made with what's on the flop. And in that situation, you just have to represent that hand. As uh, Ghost Zappa gets two power against the eights. Happy days. Well, true to form, we've not seen a great deal of bluffing. We've seen quite a lot of pre-flop madness on this table, but yeah. not much in the way of what I'd say was constructive bluffing. It's a nice table to watch. It's been quite aggressive. Mm, it has been, yeah. And aggressive poker is fabulous to watch and is generally how the game should be played, I think. Yeah, that's right. Moderated aggression. Aggression, intelligent aggression, should we say. Wow, look at that. Kaf Kaf gone all in with the jacks. Ace King, kind of cool. It's a race. Oof. Five chips left for Golden Jaguar. Look at that. He doesn't hit with the Ace King. So many times I've been burnt with the Ace King. The yeah. Anna Corner Cover looks good, but seldom wins. What a wonderful saying. And we don't get this wrong, it is a big hand, but it isn't a made hand, is it? It's you a can. big hand if you're short stacked. If mm -hmm. you're shoveling chips into that pot, way in excess of what the original blinds were, you're doing something wrong. Well, decision for Chaos Legion. I don't think it's that hard. Bad Angle's only got uh, five big blinds. I wonder if the decision Chaos was facing was whether to call or raise and push everyone out and isolate himself against Bad Angle. And I might have gone for the isolating move myself. Got two pair? Yeah. Only has a sp another spade to worry about. And bad Angle, if it does make a flush, will be a bit surprised, I think, to find that with three opponents, his four of spade is the winner. I don't want to see two spades, though. Ooh, look at that. Yum, yum. Got his lucky little flush there. Yeah, golden jaguar out. So it's, all, it's a thinking game. that You have to take everything into consideration when you're playing, when you're deciding what to do. And there's so many things to remember. But they do all come with time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when, you, when you're picking up poker, at the start, there just seems to be a ridiculously large amount of things to, to worry about, like whether it's your turn to blind, for example. But the more you play, the more things just become automatic, and then you can concentrate on, on the sort of absolute details of what your opponent is doing and the finessing your opponent. And then every now and then, when you've played a lot of poker, you'll, you'll have to stop and say to yourself, well, of some of the things that have become automatic, are they making me predictable? And then you have to go back and revisit those and shake up your play a bit. But there's a massively steep learning curve at the start of poker where you quickly get enough experience so that things stop surprising you in the way that they do the first time you play poker. So your two pair got beat. I mean, you find that incredible when you first play poker, but uh, you only have to play for a few weeks and you realise that two pair can be easily beat. OK, what about sevens here? Mm. They're in early position. Mm -hmm. So he's still got people to act behind him, so mm -hmm. he doesn't have the information on those players, so they could do anything, just like Kafka Kafka's done. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so is this an easy fold now for Quink, or are the sevens good enough to be playing? I think it's an unwise call from Quink. Kaffa Kaffa has been put in the big big raise recently, but he did have jacks. So in that situation, Quink's either up against something like Ace King, which is almost 50%, or he's up against a better pair, in which case he's about four to one behind. So it's an easy fold there. Is it um, an OK strategy to think, if I'm going to play hands like sevens, I would rather be raising with them than calling with them? Yes and no. I mean, that's a very good principle generally in poker. If your hand is good enough to call with, it, it should be good enough to bet with. And betting gives you the, the advantage that your opponents may fold and you'll pick up the chips in the middle without actually having to take them to a showdown. But sometimes in poker you get yourself to a situation where if you bet a large amount relative to the blinds, you're only going to get called by a hand that is significantly better than yours. Okay. And that's not winning poker because you're forcing your opponents to make the right decision. You make them fold if they're worse, you make them call if they're better. So in the particular case of sevens, there's a better way to play it, which is to try and see the flop cheaply, and then if you catch a seven, which you will do about one time in about one time in eight roughly, if you catch a seven, then you know you're strong and you can do what you like. Well, we've got a bit of a bluff here. Look, ace two with absolutely nothing. And it's going to work. And it seemed it's, a, it's quite a ballsy time to make that bluff because he doesn't have many chips. And the bet he made, which was 150, was a lot of his stack. So he was risking quite a big proportion of his stack to try and take that pot. Yeah, I'll stick it down as a bluff, Michelle. I mean, with the ace there, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a chance he's ahead. I'm going to put that down as half a bluff, actually. Half a bluff. Because uh, I think he was ahead, in fact, wasn't he? With an ace, he might well be ahead of his opponent. He was ahead, but he had, he, he had an ace high. Yeah. Well, the ace jack has raised it four times the big blind to 200. Four times the big blind being a general raise pre flop. Everybody has their own little raises they make, depending on how big the blinds are. Trip twos. How's them Ooh, for apples? Ooh, ghost zapper now only with 310 chips. Yeah, lots of trouble. He's only got six big blinds. So he's looking now for a hand to stick it all in with. Believe me, folks, calling with six big blinds. Uh, is just pointless. Maybe with aces, but anything else, really, you'd rather pick up the 75 there in the middle than risk taking it to a showdown. So when you're playing in a tournament, when your stack starts to get low, instead of calling um, pre-flop, we're looking at pushing all in and trying to either double through or go out. Absolutely. And this is, again, something that beginning players, when they play multi-table tournaments, they don't understand, that there is a critical threshold. And it's around about eight or nine big blinds, where if you put in a small raise and someone raises you back for all your chips, you're probably going to have to call, because there's now so much in the middle that uh, if you've got a credible hand, you're probably getting the right odds to go in and see if you can outdraw him on the flop. So once you're in about eight or nine big blinds, it's all in or fold. And strangely, around about that, that stack size, you have to throw away hands that you could play if you had fewer chips, or if you had more chips. If you've got more chips, you can play them speculatively for a raise and then throw it away if something comes over the top of you. I'm thinking about hands like maybe um, a pair of sevens or mm -hmm. maybe ace ten. If you've got fewer chips than, than eight or nine big blinds, then you can stick it all in. But unfortunately, at around about nine big blinds, again, by moving all in with a certain class of hand, you're forcing your opponents to make the right decision. Call if they're ahead and fold if they're behind. Now, any pair pre-flop to any two overcards, so say something like ace king against a pair of sixes or ace ten against a pair of twos, the pair is always slightly ahead pre-flop. Nearly always, nearly always. In the cases where you've got something like a pair of fours against jack ten suited or middling connected suited cards, then in fact the overcards are slightly ahead. Really? Yeah. Even though it's an all-made hand? That's right, yeah. Oh, because there's so many things they can hit, like a straight or... Yeah, you've got straights, flushes, and of course they're just hitting the overcards. But ace-king certainly is behind any pair. It's a little worthy hint, pointer to remember. Um, in, especially in the latest, latter stages of a tournament, if you're sitting there with a pair of sevens or a pair of sixes, sometimes it is a good time to push all in if you're dwindling slightly. Yeah. That's right. So we're full table again here. We've got West Ham in seat eight. What would you rather push it in with if you're dwindling in a tournament? Would you rather have an ace king or would you rather have a pair of sixes? Ace king. To the sixes? Definitely, yeah. Yeah? Even Not though sixes are ahead pre-flop? Oh, absolutely. I mean, if I've got sixes, I might run into a nightmare. 
pair of sevens upwards mm -hmm. with an ace king, the only nightmare, the only real nightmare is a pair of aces, which is very unlikely when I've got one of them. Mm -hmm. A pair of kings is not the end of the world. And furthermore, with the ace king, if you find yourself in a three way pot, which you might well do, you're not in terrible shape, but with a pair of sixes and a three way pot, you're, you're in a nightmare situation. Because mm -hmm. there's a higher chance that someone will have a pocket pair, and also, even if they've only got overcards, if between them they've got four live overcards, then well, wow, your sixes are not going to be good unless they catch a six. But sixes against ace king, won't sixes win more more than the ace king? They will if you if you knew your opponent had, uh, or if you could choose whether you're going to have sixes or ace king, and your opponent would have the other hand. Of course, mm -hmm. you take sixes. Okay. But you don't know what your opponent's got. For sure, so. For sure, no. And when you put it in with the sixes, sometimes you'll have a pair of sevens. Mm -hmm. But if you put it in with the ace king, what can he have? A pair of aces? Not very likely. Knowledge. Pure Wonderful gold. Thing. Gold dust. <laughs> Can make you dollars by the end of the year. So an ace nine against an ace ten. <laughs> this was the battle between John Clark and Beat the Presenter the other day. He had the ace nine and the other guy had the ace ten. And what happened? Uh, John hit his nine and the other guy hit his ten. John raised, the other guy re raised him all in, he called and lost. Yeah. Oh well, them's the breaks. Poor old John. Well, look there, it was that ace nine booting out the ace ten, which would have caught the flop. Yeah. Mm, there you go, that's how you play it. Okay, Queens, he's only made a minimum raise of 100. Oh no, he's on the big blind. He's on the big blind, yeah. Jack eight suited calling here. Yeah, it's a lame limp, isn't it, Michelle? Come, really? come in with a raise if you're going to play it. Pretend you've got something a bit better. Yeah, an appropriate fold, I think. Quink takes it down. Here's the ace king, Kaf Kaf playing it fairly standard way, bringing it in for a raise, hoping to get position by pushing everyone out. In fact, he won't be sorry if he takes the uh, the pot down here. The trouble with his ace king out of position is that you're only going to catch an ace or a king on the flop about one time in free, and uh, if you don't, you're liable to be bluffed off the pot by someone with a lousy holding like 10 jack who hasn't connected. So difficult to play. Why is position so important? Because there's an information gradient, Michelle, and uh, the later you are in the order of um, action, then the more information you've got about what people have. Of course, they're going to uh, try and deceive you, but there's a limit to what they can do, and certainly if you're good at reading opponents, then you'll know whether their bet is a bluff or, or a genuine bet, and the thing is, if you're last to act, you know what they're going to do. Also, of course, if you're in late position, and uh, you've got a, a fearsome reputation and people are scared to bet at you in case you raise them, then you see a lot more free cards. You might flop, say, for example, a flush draw, and you're in late position. Uh, they don't know if you're going to bet or not, so they check. So when it comes around to you, you can check and see if the turn card gives you a flush. If you're in early position and you check, they may take that as a green light to push you off the pot, so you never find out if uh, you're going to make a flush or, alternatively, you've got to pay to draw to it, which is not quite as nice. If you're sitting on the dealer button and everybody has checked and the flop's come down, there's no raise, people just limped in, everybody checks round to you once the flop comes down, doesn't mm -hmm. look particularly scary. Is the right thing to do their bet and try and take it or is it more beneficial to give yourself a free card? Well, no, Michelle, that is one of the, uh, the timeless poker questions. You should always ask yourself first before you bet, assuming that you don't think you're ahead, mm -hmm. will they fold? And that's the most important thing about bluffing. I get asked a lot. How do you bluff? When should you bluff? It's pretty simple, folks. When you think they'll fold. And there are certain principles you should uh, respect, like the more players there are in a pot, oh, I used to fear it gets done on the river. The more players there are in the pot, the less likely your bluff is to be successful. Mm -hmm. That's just one of them. But ask yourself when you're on the button, will they fold if I bet? If the answer is no and you're drawing, then check. Take the free card. If the answer is yes... Or even if you just don't know. Yeah, or if, if you're not reasonably certain there's a chance, then just check and take the free cards. And then if they all check around you again, then you can definitely stick in a bet. Yeah, now Probably. you're getting quite a lot of information. Unless somebody's being a bit trappy. I mm. mean, this is the thing, if you're going to bet on the button if everyone's checked around to you, generally checking does mean weakness, so fair enough, but you do have to be aware that sometimes people will have the, a brilliant hand and will be checking to get you to bet at them. Exactly. So they can come over the top of you. But then again, when they do that, at least you know where you are. You can think, fair enough, he's trap-checked me, I can fold it now. 
That's true, you do. But, and that's why I don't recommend betting, uh, bluffing on a draw when there's only a small chance that uh, they're going to fold because, sure, you know where you are now that they've checked raised you, but if you checked, now you'd have had the flush, say, on the turn. They still get a good hand, but now you're in that situation you want to be in as a poker player where you've got a good hand and they've got an almost as good hand and you've thrown that away. So um, generally, unless you're sure they're going to fold, draw cheaply. And saying all of that, Therefore, if you're on the button and you make a bet and somebody re-raises you, you put it down, the re-raising itself could be quite a good re-bluff against the dealer button original bluffer. <laughs> it, it could be, and people will do that on a draw in early position. They'll uh -huh. say, well, I've got a flush draw. I'm first to act. Um, I don't want to bluff it because I don't know what's going to happen, but I'll just check it, try and get a, a draw cheaply. Then when it gets around to the button, the button puts in the bet, and the, the guy in first position says, hang on a minute, I don't quite believe this. I'm going to raise it and take this now. And he makes more money yeah. than he would if he put in the bet first to act because he gets that dealer's little bluffette in as well. So people will do it. Nick Welthall, for example, will do that. Yeah, he's I a cheeser, that you. Nick, isn't he? He's a cheeser, whatever that means in, in <laughs> Essex. Hip, hip, young talk, doc, don't worry. Oh, is it? Young person's talk? <laughs> OK, fine. Um, but, yeah, but it's quite a ballsy bluff. More cowboys there for Landaukul, a guy in C1. Landaukul. Mm, is that young person's talk? Yeah. yeah. What does it mean? You don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it could be his last name. Ah, oh, Panini in trouble. Panini is all the way out for Ford here, unless he catches a miracle. I don't know what miracle it's going to be. A couple of tens. Jack Ace. How is Panini going to get out of this? Only by folding. Bessie's away, Panini's away. Right, well, we're going to break shortly, I think. Not quite, not, well, not quite yet, but we are going to do some... We are scheduled for one, we case, are sure. scheduled for one at one point. Doc needs to powder his nose. Um, we do have some emails. We've got one from Alex. He says, I've been playing poker on the internet for about 10 months, but never played live. I've watched live games and was wondering why the dealer deals a dead card, the flop card, turn and river. Hope we get to read this, as I am hoping to start playing live games and knowing this would help. Um, thanks very much. Um, Doc. Alex says, lover your show. I love your show. I love you too, Alex. Uh, the reason why the dead card is uh, dealt is in case the deck is marked. So say the deck is marked um, and there's no uh, card burnt, then you know what card's going to come. But the point of burning the card is then you remove the card that everyone's had a chance to see during the last round of betting, and then you reveal on the flop, turn in the river, uh, cards that no one's had a chance to see. Yes, yeah, so because some people try and mark them with their fingernails. Oh, and they'll try sorts. every single angle. Terrible. Um, if you have a question, do remember to get them into us. And we are talking about bluffs as well tonight. We want to know when you've been bluffed or when you've done a particularly good bluff or how big a part of your game is it. And um, the tax number is 84222. Do text the word poker and then your question. And you can email us as well, poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. And we've got an email here from Will, it says, Hi Dr Tom and the Night Nurse, I played online for a while tonight after having a little bit of an argument with my girlfriend to try and relax and let off some steam. But I found that my judgement seemed to be affected and I may have made some stupid decisions. I am a winning player but tonight it just wasn't happening. Do you think that your state of mind is an important part of playing poker? Cheers guys, don't think I could survive without watching Poker Night Live. And this does make a big difference. Yeah, I when mean, you're, playing, you're bonkers, Will, really, to, uh, to let off steam by playing poker. I mean, you must know this, that it's a game of, of calculation. And you, you're better off ripping up money, really, because it's uh, more satisfying and probably cheaper than sitting down and logging on when you're in a bad mood. But do invoice your girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, do. Buy something nice if you've had an argument. Um, right, well, we're going to head over to a cash game. This is table four. And it is... fifty cent. Here they are, Snappets, Big Tom Fooler, Goose, Bluff Boy, John Boy Rebel, Johan Haran, Benz is loving it. And these guys, some of these guys must so, know so much about each other's play. I mean, Snappet, Johan Haran, John Boy Rebel, always there. Yes, but they mix their play up. They do, and it's interesting because Johan Haran is, and John Boy Rebel are both aggressive players, and Snappet, or loose aggressive players, I'd say, and Snappet is 
tight aggressive, although he's, uh, he's loosened up a bit over time. Um, but a lot of their players are going to be geared towards misrepresenting what they've got in the light of what they think their opponents think their style is. So Snapper will, will make a few moves here and then, but not that many. Whereas uh, he's a player who looks like he doesn't really enjoy making moves, whereas John Boy Rebel looks like a player who loves it. And uh, there's a middle ground there. You can't, you can't love making moves too much that uh, people just say, well, I'm going to call you down with middle pair because you're probably at it, if you are at it. And likewise, you should have a few moves up your sleeve, otherwise you become too predictable. Well, we're at a cash game. The blinds are 25 50 cent. They stay like that. They do not move. And the amount you can see in front of our players is actually the cash they're playing with. $53.37 for Snap It. Big Tom Fuller, $113. He's made a bit of a profit this go round because the maximum you can sit down with at this, excuse me, at this table is $50. So, does the style of play change when you're sitting on a cash game to your tournament? Yeah, it can do. I mean, the, the biggest difference is that people have got lots of chips relative to the blinds. Um, so you, you kind of have more options in a cash game to, uh, to sort of pursue a plan that's going to unfold around about the turn or the river, whereas in a, a tournament, often you're all in by the flop. So I, I'd say probably that in, ca in a cash game, it's less easy to say that, that play was right or wrong than in a tournament because you have got more room to make a move that apparently looks like a loser at one point but in fact can make you profit provided that you play it right later on on a further street on the turn or the river. So, um, yeah, it's a bit more speculative, should we say, cash game play. Having said that, lots of players do play it even though it does open up the doors to being a, a speculative, fancy player, lots of players play much less fancily in cash games than in tournaments. And the reason is that they can pursue a particular strategy in a cash game of just waiting for big hands. Because you've got those big stacks, then you only have to hit, in No Limit Poker, a reasonable hand maybe once a night and get paid for your whole stack uh, and only very rarely get outdrawn to, for that to constitute a reasonable profit. So you can pursue that strategy of, of being a rock, whereas you can't in a tourney because the blinds are going up too fast and you'll get swallowed up by them. Harry Kings for you and Aaron. Mm. Well, it's lovely for a player like him because he's got a fairly uh, loose reputation, so it's more likely that people will come along with him. Sadly, however, the only boy with anything is John Boy Rebel. Wow, Goose has come in and he's playing those for the implied odds. Ooh. <laughs> But it's the kings that have caught. John Boy Rebel's caught. Goose can get out of this for sure now. And I think we might even see some action from John Boy Rebel here. He may have checked into Johan, hoping to have Johan represent the ace. Ah, well, interesting. John Boy catches the ace but lets it go. He obviously was only interested in the suited aspect of those cards when he played them pre-flop or the chance of making aces and fours. OK, you said, oh, we've got some pre-flop folds here. So uh, what does this tell us, uh, John? <laughs> uh, well, um, Agatha, it tells us how loose <laughs> the players, how, how loose <laughs> and how tight they are. So I said Snap It was a tight player. There he is. He's folded pre-flop more often than everyone else. And uh, John Boy Rebel uh, pinned as loose. There he is. Yeah, and Huron actually is uh, at the tighter end on this particular sample. What should you be playing at in these cash games? What's a good... Or does it not matter? Is it just different styles? Yeah, it is different styles. I mean, if you're, if you're a good loose aggressive player, you can, you can probably, play a, um, probably play a third of the hands. Probably play a third of the hands pre-flop, just about at an eight-handed table. I think it's difficult to play more than that. But if you're playing... Huge pop, by the way, wow, Doc. Wow, yes. Two pair, no good for Snap It. And that's rather unfortunate. He was pretty much committed to that pot there. John Boy Rebel catches the flush. Let's see if he reloads. He um, he called a big a big bet there for uh, for his flush draw on the flop. John Boy Rebel. Yeah. Well, there is a danger. If Snap It made it too too expensive for John Boy Rebel to call, then frankly, John Boy made a mistake. Yes, because John Boy was not getting odds to call for his flush there. Okay, I didn't see it, but I believe you if you say it's true. So in the long run, Snap It will make money, but it okay. it hurts. Yeah. Boy, it hurts. 
Again, uh, talking about odds very quickly, um, we can use that as a good example. Um, Doc, if you wouldn't mind just explaining to us what they are and how we use them in poker. Yeah, pot odds are the order of the day. There are basically two kinds of odds you use in poker, and they're used together. Um, first, we need to know the odds of making your hand, or the chance of your hand being a winner. So say you've got a flush draw like John Boy Rebel had there. He's got two hearts in his hand, there's two on the board, uh, and he's facing an all-in bet from Snap It, if that's the way it was. Um, he knows, or should know, I'm sure he does know, any decent poker player knows, that the chance of making a flush by the river, if you've got a draw on the flop, is one in three. So those are your, uh, some people call them card odds, some people call them true odds. But those are basically the odds of making your hand. And you must compare those against the pot odds, which is the amount you're being asked to put in the pot compared to how much you'll win if you win it. So say so there's 20 bucks in the pot and Snap It bets 40, that means there's now 60 in the pot and you're being asked to call for 40. So you're putting 40 to win 60, that's one and a half to one, three to two, those are the pot odds which unfortunately do not justify a call when you're only two to one against making your hand. So the general rule is that if the pot odds are longer than the chance of making your hand, then you're fine. But if the pot odds are shorter, then you shouldn't be playing it. I didn't see that, but Goose was in the pot as well, so he may have made up the pot odds so that uh, John Boy Rebel could call. OK. Um, what about if, uh, if the pot is... Let me try and work out which is the best way to ask, ask this question. Um, if there's $40 in the pot and you're being asked to put in 10, so basically you've got to, put it, you've got to pay $10 to win 40. Yeah, so you're getting 4 to 1. If you see it in 4 to 1 odds. Um, what if you're on a flush draw on the turn, so it's 4 to 1 to get your flush by the next card? then you're exactly even. It makes no difference if you call your fold. I'm sorry, I think I just said that you should fold if the pot odds were longer. It's if the card odds are longer. I should just clarify that. Oh, okay. If you're getting very long pot odds, you should call um, compared to the card odds. So that is the way to do it. I'm not sure okay. what I said, but just to clarify <laughs> that up, you call if the pot odds are longer than your card odds. Um, so if that situation that I said you're on, so you're getting evens to call, what's then the right decision to make? So where it makes no difference if you call or fold? Yeah. I would call, because yeah. uh, generally in a cash game, because your opponent might be bluffing. It's just a chance that your flush draw is in fact ahead. OK. So if you're getting evens odds, call. Cool. Two players with a pair here. And the ace stands up. Oh, John Boy Rebel's got the ban in. 7-8 off suit. Fold, fold. Raise. He's got Johan on his left. He can do anything. He can call, he can fold, he can raise. I don't mind any of those plays, to be honest. And he's called. I've got a limp. A limp what? And he's missed. <laughs> Johan Hiron's going to take it down. Maybe he's Jack. Oh, hum. A couple of rag kings. I've got a pair of queens, top right hand for Snap It. Not much to contest them, though. So if he puts in a raise, he'll probably take it. Yeah, certainly should do. None of these are calling hands. With the possible exception of Bluff Boy, who might call hoping to catch a two. But you've got to choose your opponent very carefully there, because Snap It's someone who could probably get away from it. I mean, you might catch a two, for example, but if there's an ace on the board, then uh, you're not going to get paid by anyone who doesn't have an ace. So you don't make so much when you do hit as you need to to make back all the money you lose when you pay before the flop and don't catch on the flop. Just not a bit worried about that ace. 7 10 with absolutely nothing. Nothing? Nothing. Well, he has got a gut shot, but it didn't come. He's got a full flush on the river. He's got a what? A full flush on the river. Not worth much. It's not worth anything. You're right. You're right. Hmm. 
10 jack for Snap It. He's early in early position, but it might be worth a bit of a limp. Sue today chooses not to play. Another rag ace, a couple of rags coming up here. Raggy, which is raggier? Well, three is raggier. On this occasion, ace nine is good. That's rag against rag. Right, well, we'll leave it there for the moment. I've got an email here from 20... Oh, I can't do that one. Sorry, that's for after the multi-table tournament. Oh. <laughs> We've got one here from Brian. Um, hello, Brian. He says, uh, Hi, Michelle and Tom. Great show. Um, I watch most days or nights. Um, you're just talking about odds. Can you explain what is meant by implied odds, please? Um, I'm trying to pluck up the courage um, for playing for real. <laughs> um, well, you should play. For, you know, Give it a go. You can play... In really small tournaments, for anything for like 50 cents tournaments, I think they do, and a dollar tournament, so they're good ones to start off in, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, implied odds are, uh, well, they're a dark art, really, but uh, I'll try to explain them in a way that will be useful for you. Uh, when you call with a pair of twos before the flop um, against, say, a raise from someone who's put in a decent-sized raise, let's have a look at the situation there, snap it, put in a raise to the queens, and you call with the twos, you know uh, your chance of catching a two on the flop is seven and a half to one against. You know that because you've taken the time to learn it. Now, you're not getting pod odds normally to uh, call on that basis. It's very rarely the case that you're going to be putting in uh, money there where you're going to have pot odds of seven and a half to one. The reason why you're calling the twos is that if you catch a two and make trips, which is a big mystery hand, you're likely to get paid. And so you're calling not on the basis of what the pot is now, but on the basis of what the pot will be when you win it, mwa ha ha ha. So basically, though, I said it was a, I said it was a dark art. It's very hip. Is it? Yes. Was I briefly hip? You really oh, were. Thank well you very done. much. You saw it here on Poker Night Live. <laughs> um, so you're calling on the basis of what the pot will be, and you can only form uh, an educated guess about that. So basically, the rule is is that if you're not quite quite getting pot odds, but you think that you will build a bigger pot when you hit and win it then basically you're in the land of implied odds. Which is a fun place to be. Which is a, a fun place to be, though many people go there and justification, I would say, Brian, so be <laughs> careful. Well, uh, do remember as well, we're talking about bluffs tonight. We're having a look at uh, who's bluffing, when and where, and if it's correct to do so, or even if it works. Um, do let us know all your bluffing stories. Um, have you bluffed? Have you been bluffed? Was it good? Was it not? Has it worked for you? Um, how do you do that? Well, you can text us. The text number is 84222. Do you remember to put the word poker first and then your question? And that's four for a pound. Not bad. Not bad at all. Thanks, Doc. You can email as well, poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. How much is that? That's free. That's a rip-off. Um, after the break, we're going to have Beat the Presenter. Um, we've got a bit of uh, wonderful news for the guys and girls at home because you're going to have... Hopefully a good half hour to 45 minutes of Dr. Tom analogy. So put on the video recorder, one day it'll be worth a fortune. It's going to be wondrous. So are you, are you going to play abroad soon, or have you got any, any plans to play some more big poker tournaments? Mm. I know John Clark just come back from playing abroad, did quite well. He went to play backgammon, but ended up, lost that, ended up playing poker and winning. Ah, that's come right. First, yeah, where was yeah. he? Somewhere exotic? I can't remember. I can't remember either. Shows the backgammon players are the, the people to go and play poker against, I guess. Yeah, so you, have you got any plans to go and play? I'm going to Poland, but I don't think I'm playing poker. No? No. Just a holiday. Not interested in that, then, just the poker. <laughs> well, are you going anywhere? Are you going board anywhere hot for poker? Do let us know as well. And if uh, you need any information on how you can go and play poker abroad, then why don't you ask the fellas on the forum on the net? It's www.pokernightlive.co.uk. Um, we've got some lots of good threads up there and information on any type of poker. Well, we're going to a break now, so enjoy the poker news, and Dr. Tom and I will join you after the break. Good evening, welcome back to Poker Night Live. Thanks for joining us again. The night nurse is ensconced on a uh, table here, playing a bit of a blinder. So before we go back to our tables, let's have a look at an email. We've got one here from Andy saying, Hi, Michelle and Dr. Tom. 
Last week I played in a small private live tournament and we had a little disagreement on how to manage the small and big blinds when a player busts out. Say, for example, the person who posted the big blind and should post the small blind next goes out of the tournament. Should then the person directly to this person's left then post the small or big blind? I understand that we can make up our own rules in a private game, but what's the norm in the bigger tournaments? Uh, the answer is that the player to the left should post the big blind uh, because he would have posted the big blind regardless of what happened there to the guy who was previously the big blind poster. And in that situation, there'll be a dead small blind. So there will just be one blind, and it will be the big blind. Generally, when it comes to sorting out the blinds in a tournament, uh, uh, certainly when it gets down to a short-handed state or going from three-handed to two-handed, just remember the following basic principles, which are that you must pay the big and the small blind in order to get the button. You can't big blind twice, and if you do post both the big blind and the small blind, then you do get the button, and that should normally sort you out. OK, thanks for that, Andy. Um, well, Michelle is um, still in the tournament, so we're going to take <laughs> ourselves down to, I think, the multi-table tournament and see how they're getting on down there. You say that with surprise, Doc. No, I'm only kidding. Do you realise I have the second best score on Beat the Presenter to Cass? Where are you, about fifth? <laughs> fifth? Oh, I'm lucky if I'm fifth, I think. How is the rankings at the moment? I don't know. All I know is that Cass was first and I was second. Ah. I played on your account the other day, Michelle. I know, I can see the money's gone down. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to do something about it. How come you haven't doubled up yet? Um, I'm waiting for the hand. Look at this, fives versus fives. Would you add them and eve it? I think this is going to be a chop somehow. And we've got calf calf here with 11,000 and some, more or less 12,000. So he's chipperoonied up. Massive stack. Thirty runners left on four tables, and Kath Kath makes uh, an absolute mystery hand there. Fortunately for quite tight, he's got nothing to fight back with. Kath Kath is, in fact, our biggest stack in the tournament at the moment. Sitting there with uh, 40, 40 big blinds. He doesn't want to fight back here because those chips are going in. Mad Nev, I think, going to take this to a two-handed confrontation. Well, now, pot odds here are two to one to the Mad Angle. He's putting in 600 to win 1350. It's around about two to one. And um, trouble here is that he may be ahead. His opponent may have Ace King, but it's difficult to know. So Mad Angle can only really be safe on that flop if it comes down with a four. And as we said earlier. Chances of that are seven and a half to one. So he wasn't getting the pot odds to call and he folded. Having said that, Michelle, you have played more than the male presenters because you play more often. I have, yes. But what does that say? Well, it, I've still won more. Well, you would ex be expected to if you play more. Provided you're a winning player, which of course you are. I'm just pointing out a statistical Stop fact. Stop taking away from the glory. OK. You're wonderful. <laughs> That's better. Who's going to move on this one? Well, Mad Angle is, I think, here in the best position to steal. But now, really, I can lay that down. And Mad Angle thinks likewise. And the main advantage of that hand is putting in a bet if no one else has come in and taking the blinds. Three players take a flop, and the ace is caught. And a uh, pair of sevens there isn't such a bad thing for Kaffa Kaffa, because if he is up against a mystery higher ace, something like ace six, there's now a much higher chance that he'll end up splitting it as opposed to losing. When a small ace comes up against another small ace, and both catch an ace, uh, the pot is often split because of the presence of higher cards that negate the kicker. Fold folds, and Sharky Shark with 10 big blinds, 11 big blinds, decides he's too short stack to start stealing with that sort of hand, lets it go, looking for a better holding. And let's see if quite tight moves on this one. He's uh, not got too many big blinds himself. 
lets it go, and I think quite wise to do that. Wait till he's in position, or he's holding a better hand. Daz here going to go all in. Yeah, he's quite right to do that. And as it happens, he'll get a call from a worse hand, so he's not done anything terribly wrong. Of course, he'd rather have his opponents fold, because he knows now that it's a race. Just got to dodge uh, an ace or a king, and he successfully dodges and doubles up, and it's bet the lot, who did his best to, but unfortunately he had Daz covered, who is now in bad shape. Bad shape. Let's see if he's on tilt. Don't bet the jack three here. People will think you're on tilt, so they'll call you, so let the jack three go. Having said that, it's a loose call from Mad Angle, and a raise here probably would take it down. Mad Angle outdraws the guy who's dominating him. Mad Nev got the much better hand there, but Mad Angle catches the nine. And now in good shape, 900 in the pot. I think we'll see a, I would put in a pot size bet here to uh, deny anyone drawing to a straight with a lone eight, the sort of odds they need. I think that's a bit too much. In fairness, it's got every indication there that no one's got anything, but there's just a danger someone's got ace nine or conceivably a higher pair. There is ace nine, one hand too late. Still got ace eight dominated. Do you play mini multi take tournament stock? Well, I played a free roll the other night for a, for a free case of wine. Yeah. Well, in fact, it was 1,500 quids worth of wine. Oh, that was on, yeah, I remember. Mm. Didn't play very well, but knocked out of Queens. But, um, yes, it was a good laugh. The guy who won it, uh, Ram Chip, took the money oh, instead. Yes. Took oh, did he? 750 quid instead of the, the yeah, full... Yeah, I think I would have, to be honest. Really? Yeah. You're throwing away 750 pounds worth of fine wine by doing that. Yeah, but I can just buy some Lambrini. I'm from Essex. <laughs> That was extremely honest, Michelle. <laughs> and unfortunately, you took away the joke I was going to make. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm too clever and I knew it was coming. <laughs> we're going to get sued by Lambrini. <laughs> or we'll get a case of it in the post. Mm. Ooh, Fishing for Chips just mentioned Patrick Antonius. It's got my heart going. I've got to, I've got to set up that heads up match with him. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then I think he'll, I can persuade him to marry me. Could you put that banana away? <laughs> King 10 limping, highly unorthodox play. And unfortunately, he'll have to either lay it down now or make a wrong call. So either way, he's uh, going to lose money on this whole coup, on average. And bet the lot, I think it's going to get an extra 300 that he couldn't have expected to have. He's quite right to move all in there with the ace jack. And takes it down. So four stacks here at this table that are pretty short stacked, 10 big blinds. So these are pretty much on the cusp of that point I was saying where you really got to bet everything or, or just fold. Just about room for a call with 10 big blinds if you think there's a reasonably good chance no one's going to raise you. That's a vital point there. If you think you're going to get raised, then don't call when you're short stacked. Because, well, what options have you got? You can fold and throw away your call, or you can call, but then you're finding yourself in a showdown situation. And when you're short stacked, you'd nearly always rather do the betting yourself and uh, take the pot without taking it to a confrontation. No, well, three of them have taken this flop, so someone must have called. And there's uh, a bluff. But he did have the best hand, so uh, we won't write it down as a bluff. 26 runners left. There's the ace nine again. Do you do much bluffing, Doc? Um, I do. Are you a bluffer? Yeah. I'm not uh, an absolutely um, congenital one, if I can mm -hmm. say that word. I mean, I will move with any cards if mm. I feel I'm going to get a fold. OK. So mostly I'm, I don't bluff that much, but I'm prepared to move with, with absolutely nothing.
Remember, folks, that when people make mistakes in poker, the mistake they make much more often is calling when they should fold. People tend to be too loose. So that's why bluffing, certainly online, is, is actually not... It's not really the gateway to riches. People are much more likely to wrongly call you when you're ahead than to wrongly fold when you're bluffing. So there's much more to be said for waiting for a big hand and then getting paid off for it than always trying to be in there bluffing out your opponents. Yeah, I do find you get called more on a lot of the sites. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of looser players. Calling stations, they're called. Daz didn't get paid with his queens, but he's called a queen now, and in fine shape. Kaffa Kaffa is a very long way away from any hand whatsoever. Now, he can slow play this. And in some ways, he's in a good situation. I don't like that move, because uh, he pushes out his opponent there. He was probably only drawing to a king or an ace. And when I'm the short stack in the multi-table tourney, because I really don't mind laying my tournament life on the line, until really quite close to the bubble. Certainly at the start of the tournament, I'm quite happy to get on with chips in and with what I believe to be the best of it and then go and do something else. Do the ironing if I get knocked out or play another tournament, much more likely really. Um, in fact, infinitely more likely than doing the ironing. But um, because I'm quite happy to put all my chips in, I don't mind trying to um, elicit a move from the big stack. Some players, when they've got a big stack at a multi-table tourney, think it's their God-given right to push you around. You can only be pushed around if you're willing to let them do that. So there on the, uh, the flop there, in Daz's situation, I might have checked and um, seen if Kaffa Kaffa just put in a pretty much automatic bet on the turn, having seen me apparently show weakness on the flop. And if he's, he's caught a card on the turn and that's moved him ahead or it's moved into a draw situation and he makes it on the river, good luck to him. Because when he puts his, his money in on the turn, I'm going to raise him. And mostly I'm going to be ahead there, because mostly he's just doing it because he's trying to push me around. Um, so I would urge you to consider that as one option. There's really not much to be said for conserving chips or playing it safe when you've got so few, so few pines. Shaky shake with a pretty weak gut shot draw there, trying to catch the eight, and it won't be all that great if he does catch the eight because it makes lots of high straights, two I'm thinking of. And he lets it go to Mad Angle. Maybe it's Mad Angle. Fives again for Daz. And he's played more than his fair share of pots recently. Oh, you're such a rock, Michelle. <laughs> See? Oi, you're supposed to be concentrating on the multi table tournament. All right. Sorry, Not looking over my shoulder gov. making comments like my dad, so Mr. Governor. No, oh, I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> really, Dad? <laughs> He's only trying to look my after dad. you. <laughs> he wants you to do well. 13.50 in the pot. Daz has got 3,000. <laughs> nice little bet there from Kaffa Kaffa. Oh, nice read from Daz. Very nice read in... Oh. Oh, I don't like the call from Kaffa Kaffa. It's fine to establish a sort of image that says I'm not going to be pushed around by minnows, but, I mean, really, what does he think he was up against? A draw? Let's have a look at that again, then. And uh, when, the, when the money went in, it was on the flop. So it was, I guess there was a flush draw there, but I think Kaffa Kaffa might have let that one go. He was calling there knowing that if his opponent had, say, a pocket pair like fives, he was still only three to one to make his hand by the river with the two overcards there. And there was a danger, of course, that Daz had something like ace-2, ace-3, ace-8, or 10-3, 10-2, 10-8, 10-8, given that he was in the big blind. And all of those hands would have meant that Kaffa Kaffa had very few outs. Ah, well. As long as he knows what his image is. But uh, I think that was a rather, a, shall we say, um, impetuous call from Kaffa Kaffa. Shaky Shark moved all in. Daz made the call and has uh, immediately got the... Uh, oh, they don't want to see a jack now. They'd split it. But Daz, Daz is fine. Two pairs good for him. Shaky Shark is evicted 
from the house. 23 runners on three tables. 10 runners on uh, Michelle's table. Yep. King Queen uh, decides to move, and uh, Peterborough United there, posh. It's a reasonable shape. He's got 20 big blinds, decides to invest a few in getting in a pot. He hasn't been in one for a while. And gets uh, no respect from Daz. Now what? Now what do you do? The trouble there is he's got two overcards. He's got the initiative, but his opponent is going to draw cheaply to a diamond there with that bet, if he's got one. He may have caught the 9 or the 10 and raised Posh to push Posh off the diamond draw. And it's difficult to know where you are, but fortunately the flop was scarier to Daz than uh, down to Posh, and it was Daz who made a mistake by folding the best hand. Well played, well played there, and Posh took that down cheaply. He put in a nice... Uh, in in the event, quite a well-judged bet there, because he, he bought that pot fairly cheaply on the flop, and he correctly identified that that flop might be so scary that his opponent wouldn't pay any price to carry on with it. So, well done. Now, Daz with the king-queen, just to double the big blind raise. Good enough to get position, good enough to get the pot. Twenty-two runners left. Let's go and have a look at the big stack then. Elsewhere in the multiverse of this multi-table tourney, it was at one time Kaffa Kaffa. It is no longer. It is Saf. Yeah, wow. Twenty-six thou. Looks like he's been involved in some big pots, and uh, he's sitting there with. Absolutely huge stack there. 65 big blinds, absolutely colossal. And it would be surprising if we don't see him at the, at the final, although a lot can happen. Nines are good. Ace Jack eliminated. Doc. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Oh. How's then Johan be raising me? Well, what do you expect if you sit down with that guy? <laughs> he only does it to get attention. Don't worry, I'll have him. Okay. You heard that, Johan? <laughs> Staff for the nines, let's see if he gets fruity. Ah, and he just attacking Willy Wolves, big blind, but uh, he may get a response from the small blind. Let's see. No, is Saf playing it safe? Interesting. Is that kind of player? I don't mind it. I don't mind the fold there. I don't think you should be ashamed of that. Well, maybe a little bit ashamed, but I might do it myself. Still, it's only a minimum raise for Willy. Oh. Takes a view, needs a heart. Doesn't catch your heart. Willie will revolve to the temple and he's out. 19 runners now. They're falling thick and fast. And the table's now becoming short-handed and will become increasingly so until we get down to 16 when they'll consolidate into two tables. So six-handed play here. And now the nines again. I'm sure Jester will move. And how much for a decent size raise? It wouldn't surprise me here. Yeah, I thought that was probably coming. He wants to take it. And Idge... A load of rubbish I'm getting. Doc, can you put some good card thoughts my way, please? Ah, uh, quit your greeting. Come on, you know it will come round. Yeah. Biding my time. Well, if you fold monsters like I've seen you fold. <laughs> Edge still at it, and Jester calling it down, and one big bluff here. Might it take it? Might it not? Oh, he's tried to buy it cheap. 
hoping perhaps that Jester was, uh, don't know what really, Jester was drawing to a flush, but if he was drawing to flush, it probably had him just a beat and didn't need to bluff it. Not sure about that. So a nice pot for Jester, and he's now second chip leader. Band moves with the eights this time. He's got, unfortunately, four overcards up against him, and the chance of dodging that lot is almost none, but the cavalry arrives there in the form of an eight, and now he's pretty much safe and dry, especially with the ace and ten quitting the field, uh, who had a flush draw on the turn. So Lando will call, doubles through, triples through, in fact. Happy days for him. I always want to sing the Happy Days theme tune when I hear Happy Days. Well, do it, Michelle. It's a sort of spontaneous <laughs> show. Just do it. I'm not allowed. <laughs> really? <laughs> Did you sing once before on the show? I sang. I didn't get my, my fingers wrapped. Yeah, but you sang Happy Birthday. It's a bit different. OK. Very lovely, I must say. It Thank was you. a treat for us all. <laughs> yes. Oh, Sly Dog. And that's... Uh, <laughs> Rather unfortunate for Edge, and that is the terrifying sight there, where you let someone in cheap and the board comes down paired and you've got a big pair and that's what you just don't want to see, because you don't know if he's got the jack or the ten. And I think Edge is probably going to do the lot here, because Saf is going to raise and Edge is going to read him for a jack, or a draw possibly, and now he needs a miracle straight or a king. Not there, and that was rather unfortunate for Edge, but uh, he took his risk by slow playing it before the flop and... Sometimes that's going to happen. Adios, sir. There was a raise. What? What are you raising? It's <laughs> nothing. JWC63. <laughs> so now we are nearly down to uh, two tables. We can see this because there's only five at this table. Seriously short handed. And if you play tournaments without a huge number of runners, then you do have to go through a, a sort of bottleneck before you reach the money, where some of the tables do get quite short-handed. And if you don't like that, then you do need to play in tournaments where they're paying up to maybe 30 or 40 or higher places to avoid a situation where you, you could end up being knocked out off the money because you can't handle short-handed play. Bit of rebalancing here. Now we've got six players here. There must have been seven at one of the other tables. Oh. Well, West Ham has called here. I don't mind this move if your opponent's a weed on the flop. That's where I call in the situation. I call if he doesn't like raising pre-flop and he's happy to lay it down on the flop. Then I can basically call with anything and uh, bet the flop whatever comes. But it's only against that specific kind of player that I like this move. If Landau call raises, Pre-flop, West Ham has to let it down. If West Ham's not prepared to bluff on the flop, then uh, he's going into it with almost certainly the worst hand. Let's have a look. I'd like to see a bet here. No, he's checked. And I think he's just wasted 300 or 200 chips there by calling pre-flop. Man never lets it go. Fold, fold, fold. And this should really be folded round to Aussie, I think. Yes, it is. He gets a walk. Very nice indeed. Very nice indeed. Aussie, our short stack uh, with 10, 11 big blinds. Land Alcal with about 12. Saf sitting there. Playing very steady, and Jester has just eaten a big meal. And how much from land? 1,200 is a fine bet here. You can easily get away from it if there's a big raise. The trouble with that land is if you're re-raised, you're probably going to have to call because you'll be getting a 2 to 1 from the pot. And if your opponent's got something like ace-10, which you might well raise with ace-jack, then uh, you're getting better than 2 to 1 chance of catching a hand there, more like 42-43%. Uh, now the ace is good for a move, 
not daunted by Jester's big stack. Yeah, I understand his logic. Now what? Trouble is, if he bets here and Jester's got a pair, Jester just may say, well, it's not very likely you've got a king and you're probably going to represent one. I'm going to call you. But fortunately, Jester had nothing and decided to give it up. Now the eights for West Ham. How much? He's got a reasonable stack. He can afford to raise. Yeah, it looks like he wants to take the pot down now. You lucky, lucky. Shut up, lucky. That's good. <laughs> well I had played, a good Michelle. Hand. Well played. Well played. <laughs> you see, you've been folding those hands all night. That's all you've got to play that sort of hand. Look, if I can fold nine, ten under a gun, if I'm not feeling it, I You're was right. feeling it that time, so I raised it. Feeling it. Okay. And then Snaggy Bug re raised, so my plan was because I'd raised under the gun and I haven't played for ages, my plan was even if he raised me on the flop, I was going to re raise him anyway and bluff. Great. Which would have been a terrible thing because he yeah. had aces. <laughs> but luckily I hit. <laughs> I love your reasoning, Michelle. It's a very sophisticated approach to the game. Yeah, Where did you learn see? it from? I learned it from this wonderful player. Should we get him on the show? I think he has a spot, actually. Does he? He's, he's all right. Who is it, Michelle? <laughs> Which you, Doc? Oh, is it? <laughs> I love it. It's all scripted. Queen five, giving it a big old dwell up. Well, let's, uh, let's come back to this one where we're at the bubble situation, because we do like a good bubble. Um, although we don't like going out on it. So we're going to pootle over to a uh, cash game. 50 cent, one dollar. Double the stakes of earlier. Let's see who's chancing their arm in this game. And, uh, oh, you and Haran, snap it. The multi tabling madmen here. In fact, half of these players were on the other game. Short handed. Ten's in good shape here. Probably only Dragon can be convinced to come along, and he's just drawing to uh, an ace. Suited cards, of course. He's about two to one to make this if he takes it to the river. And now he's got a gut shot, looking for a jack or a backdoor flush, i.e. running hearts. So it's four outs for the jacks, because there's four jacks, and you can count the backdoor flush as about one out, because you'll make it around about 4% at the time. There it is, it's coming. It's coming. 21 in the pot, and NT, I think, is going to have to check here. Because it doesn't look like there's much of a draw there. Well, that's a good bet. It's a great bet. Well, he read that nicely, or maybe he was just sticking it in and, and hoping that his opponent uh, was drawing and not sitting on a, either a, a queen he was prepared to call with or a king that he was certainly happy to call with. Good result. And a walk for dragon. Queen 10 suited in a six-handed game. This is raisable or foldable. It all depends what your image is. If your image is tight, I'd be inclined to raise it. More than that, though, because I don't want to encourage a call from the big blind. But if your image is loose, I think you can let it go. Oh, yeah. Dragon now can slow play this. Or does he bet representing a draw? Or does he bet thinking that people will say, well, he wouldn't bet if he's got the jack, he'd slow play it. And you're going to face a situation every now in poker when you know you've got to start betting with a monster to get value from it. But on the other hand, you know that you've got basically such a huge hand that no one can have anything. And poker mount's got a draw, and that's about the best he could have had. And I think there, Dragon Bet, perhaps correctly thinking, well, there's no way poker's going to put me on quads because, let's face it, there's only one jack left. So he got the call, quite a loose call from poker, who realistically there, even if he caught his gut shot, um, straight could easily be up against a pocket pair in Dragon's hand, which would have made Dragon a, a full house. So a, a loose call, I think. And a fairly loose call too here from Poker. He's missed. And look at this draw for NT head. It's an up and down straight draw, which normally are quite good in Poker, but it's a nightmare flop because if he catches a nine at the top end, that puts seven, eight, nine, ten on the board. And uh, sitting there with 5-6, well, how good is this straight? What if his opponent's got a jack? He's behind.
Fireworks, yeah, nines and a big blind against just a small blind, a big hand. Empty head, must know he's behind. I think he's very wise to fold there. Hmm. Snap it, got the edge here. He's got the free roll. If it goes to the river, more or less a free roll, it's pretty unlikely Yohan's going to make a flush with a heart or a club. So how much more is Snappit's hand worth here to Yohan Haram because it's suited? Um, that's a good question. Uh, he's going to make the flush, I guess, around about 4% of the time. Yohan Haram will almost never make the flush. So I guess it's going to be something like 52.48. But I'll put it into an odds calculator when I've got a moment, Michelle. We'll find yeah. out. Oh, well, there is the power of aggression, and that is interesting. We were saying earlier, Michelle, that ace-king for lots of people, they, they're happy to shovel it all in. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the cash game, Snap it thinks it's just a liability. He's only invested uh, about 5 or $6. He's got another 80 He's behind to a pocket pair. He's significantly behind to a, uh, a big pair, aces or kings. And in, in his heart, he must have known that there was a possibility that he was up against ace-king, but if he is, Johan Haran's not going to put it down. Uh, if his edge is only that small, 52.48, then he's really just putting in money to get it back. I don't mind his fold. And it's important to, to remember that tight players and loose players both lose pots and lose money, uh, hopefully less than they win, if they're good players. They just lose it in different places. So Snap It loses money there. That's clear. He was going to win that pot. He was going to split that pot, and sometimes he was going to win it. But you and Hiram will lose uh, money in different ways. And I think Snap is certainly intending to call this. Uh, and I think he's trying to induce a, a bet here, induce a bluff to get more money in the pot. And he's called, and perhaps hoping that his opponent's got a pocket pair, or has caught the queen. But on the river there, I think he's just checked, so he must have been slightly nervous about the seven. Cautious play. Or perhaps he was trying to induce a, a river bluff from Poker Malk and it didn't come. Have you been seeing many bluffs? Oh, I forgot. Well, we try and... For, for those of you at home that have just joined us, we, ha we are doing a bit of a bluffy thread today. We're having a look at bluffs, who's bluffing, when and where. And, uh, and we want to hear your bluff stories, so do get them into us. Um, the text is 84222, and that's uh, four for a pound. And do write the word poker first in your question. And uh, the email poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. But we've seen very, very few outright bluffs, uh, Michelle. We've seen lots of sort of pre-flop uh, shenanigans, but... To be honest... Double Top wants you to know that the uh, suited ace king is 5% five, five better off to win with a 91% for the tie. There you go. All right, so it's going to be 52 and a half, 52 and a half uh, to 48 and a half. Thank you, Double Top. Yeah, that sounds about right. Well, we've uh, halved the stakes here. Suddenly we're on 25 cent, 50 cents. But uh, our other table's down to three runners, so let's go and have a look at that, because we haven't seen any shorthanded cash action for a while. Sorry, boys. Sorry, boys. We're going to love, love you and leave you. Ah, four runners, but four runners is fine. Middle pair, good enough for Snap It there. And 10 8 seated, good enough for a Nick here for me. Jack Queen likewise. Betty order seems to have gone a bit funny here. Not quite sure why Pokemalk is acting after Benzers, but all will be revealed. Snap it. Uh, getting odds to call, yeah, quite right too. And check from NT Head, he's got nothing. Down it comes. Pokemalk gets top pair. And uh, Benzers gets middle pair. Pokemon must bet this. I put in a pot size bet here for sure because I've got three opponents who could be drawing to a straight, could be drawing to a flush. I want to take the pot now and certainly narrow the field. That's too small for me. I make it the full four.
So poker map should already be trying to work out what draw Benz is, is on, if he's on a draw. Yeah, so he should be aware of the possibility of 8-9. Is 8-9 is a possible hand? Well, it is. Poker Malk bets to find out. In fact, Benz is just calling it down with uh, an indifferent repair. Poker Malk should check here, I think. Should be check-check on the river, because he's not going to get called by a busted draw. But he does get called by the 10 there. So if he read Benz for a, a weaker made hand, which is what Benz has had, it was a great bet on the river, but difficult read to make. John Boy back. And the Dalmatian is here, good heavens. And I haven't seen him for a very long time. That is quite remarkable. Welcome back. I thought we'd lost you forever. Our two original uh, regular cash game players, Snap It and the Dalmatian. In adjacent chairs. And let's see how he plays Ace Eight suited to celebrate his return. No, what a rock! Now he's Jack on the button, on rather. What to do? You can raise, you can call. I quite like the raise there. Uh, but I only want to make that raise against relatively ABC players. I don't want to make it against a tricky player because I don't want to leave them calling me in position uh, into a pot that I've invested money in. And well played. I think fishing for chips there. Played it right. Snap it's uh, not prone to loose calls. And uh, I think he was right to make a continuation bet there. Also, uh, well, I'm not going to give away all the snap it secrets, so I won't say that. Oh, do? No, it's not fair. Come Guy's on. Guy's trying to grind out a living. Well, can you just write them down for me, then? Um, no, because you might reveal them on air, too. Dan Matanak says, hello, Doc. How are you doing? How are you doing? <laughs> it's a funny thing, isn't it? Poker is playing one table and he pops up in the chat box on another. <laughs> Wormholes in poker space. And he's playing on your table, is he? Mm. Oh. He says he's doing well. Good. Well, pocket fours is not a huge decision. I thought maybe he was doing a moody dwell up there and then going to make a call or a raise to imply that he was doing something weird with aces, but he, in the end he just let it go. Middle pair for Benzers. Got an interesting question from Dan Matanak here about uh, sit and go strategy actually, which we'll cover going into the break. Okay. Battle of the Tens. <laughs> well, he's going to have to call. But does he raise? Or has he had a disconnection? He's thinking an awful long time about this play, and I think he's been disconnected. I uh, can't believe he'd fold that for one into a pot of 750 otherwise. Yeah, and it looks that way because he's uh, gone off our radar temporarily. Ace Jack in the big blind again. Let's see if he gets as fruity with it as Fishing for Chips did. Surely a fold.
And, uh, well, Damas Neck, fairly comfortably in the lead there. 14 in the pot. Trap checks, doesn't get the bet he was looking for. Now bets, hoping that it will be taken as a bluff and that someone who was unwilling to bet, say, a, a medium pair, will now act. Dalmatinac still slow playing it, still uh, playing it cheekily there on the turn. I don't believe he was scared about poker mounts, so I think he's trying to induce another bet. And he's done it. Let's see a call. Oh, he's played it very nicely. Very nicely indeed. Welcome back. And I think he got the absolute maximum there. And, and there it is in poker. It's lovely when you've got a big hand and your opponent's got a big hand but not quite as good as yours, but that's not going to happen too often. Uh, so you've got to try and induce action from someone with a weak hand if you think you can, while at the same time not giving them too much of a free draw. And uh, Dalmatian played that very nicely. Cowboys now, likewise, trying to generate a bit of action. Doesn't get it from Earl's. And he follows exactly the same strategy now, hoping to, hoping to be read as bluffing it, having seen a, a weak check, apparently weak check from Earl, but he doesn't get the action. Not his fault, but he, uh, he did try. Poker Malk makes a loose call there, out of position with Queen High. In a short-handed pot. Short-handed pot, suitedness not so relevant, and you could have let that go. Dalmatian gets a comforting ace. And let's see if it's gone to his head with this ace three. Well, having another good old dwell up. I think he's got uh, problems with his connection, either on his computer or on his brain. So now he lets it go and it snap it. He feels here it's time he made a move. All times the big blind. Ooh, that is. That's a move from Haymurf, and he has seen Snap it fold to a re-raise so far in this game. Yeah, don't mind that move from Haymurf at all. I think it was quite well judged. Did look a bit smelly there, coming around to Snap it and betting on the button. And Snap it may even have, have sensed what might be going on, but the trouble is Haymurf does make that move with a genuine hand, and that's the hallmark of a good bluff, uh, is when it could well actually have a genuine hand behind it. So I like the move from Hamer. Eight nine now, moving and shaking. And uh, putting in three, getting raised. Snap it doing the re-raising now, and I think he'll uh, <laughs> You'll have to go. The trouble is, Snap It will, will probably bet the flop there, so he's not going to get too many free cards. And that's exactly what's happened. I think Benz has could have really said, well, if Snap It's going to bet the flop, how likely am I going to be to connect, connect with a flop with 8-9 suited? He let it go. No limp with the 3-4 off. Granite. Type in a novel. <laughs> yeah. Four five, not much to cling on to there. John Boy Rebel lets it go. And L takes it down, well played. Now, 
Ace 10 too small for the Dalmatian in early position. Ace Jack in mid position, big enough for a limp. And Ace Queen on the button, big enough for a raise. Fold, fold. And I, I let the Ace Jack go here. In fact, I prefer the call from Earl, to be honest, from a call from Ace Jack. Very big call, though. All right, well, the tournament's finished. Has it? Yeah. So you might have won it. But we will wait now until after the break. We won't know, no. Oi, uh, Earl gets the flush on the river. And he'll get paid. Ah, oh, wait, no, Fisher has got no hand, but he has got the ace there, and there's a possibility Earl is just trying it on, but it'll be a good fold. Because he's getting very nice odds for the pot there. 14 to win a pot of 50. No, oh, good discipline fold for Fisher for chips. Well played. We're on, uh, we're in vision. Michelle. Oh, he's. <laughs> I thought I was paying on a twenty dollar, but they reckon it was thirty. Mm, maniac. I'm sure it was. Oh, I'm sure it was twenty. So, did you have a good time? Yeah, it was all right. It's nice to see the Dalmatian again. How was your time? Yeah, it was okay. It'd be interesting to see what you thought of a particular hand. Okay. I think I made the right decision. Okay. Other people may disagree. They it's may. Not, not a good, good thing to yeah fools. <laughs> what are you talking about, Bruce? Um, so what are we doing Sorry, then? So was that hip talk? <laughs> yeah, what are you talking about, Willis? Um, right, so have we got some questions? What are we doing? Do you want me to take over now, by the way? You seem to Michelle. You're not your normal professional demeanour. Hi. Oh, are you? Hi. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well. What are we doing then? Come okay, on, Doc. I'll take over. We've got, we've got an email here from the Dalmatian. <laughs> oh, your friend. Who's, well, it's not, I've never met him, but you know. He says, hey, Doc, uh, I just wanted to say hello. Hello. Uh, long time no chat. Quick question about small pocket pairs. If you hold a small pocket pair towards the end of a sit and go, say the bubble, and a loose player goes all in for three times as big blinds, uh, you figure he's got two overcards to your pocket pair. Should you always fold in this situation? Does a call ever justify? What would you typically do? Good question. Uh, certainly one that you're going to see plenty of times if you're playing sit and goes. I think you should normally fold. Um, certainly if the call there seriously damages your stack. Remember you've got no fold equity there. Uh, he's almost certainly got two other cards, so you're really not very, very far ahead at all. And sometimes he will have, in fact, a bigger pair. So you're going to the situation there where you're probably barely getting pot odds. Um, and of course, if you damage your stack, then you're throwing away any fold equity you might have in the future playing in a different pot because it's less easy to push people off um, pots if you've got a smaller stack. There is also, of course, the possibility that you may not end up um, heads up with this guy. If there's any danger that someone else will come in with you, then you certainly want, don't, don't want to be in there with a small pocket pair because that guy's got a very good chance of uh, having a higher pocket pair or two live overcards that are, aren't the same as your, your loose opponent. So I think you should fold generally. The one situation where I, I would call, I think, is uh, where I have a big stack and uh, there's another big stack in the comp and he's not going to be in the pot because he's already folded and then I get a significant amount of equity by trying to knock out this short stack because then if he's knocked out and I end up in a big pot with the big stack and get knocked out myself, at least then I'm in the money. So it's one of those rare situations, I think, where you can probably go in with the wrong pot odds, provided that you're getting the longer term tournament equity by knocking out the short stack and putting you in the money. But I think you're right that mostly there you should fold. OK, well, um, we've got to go to a break now. I'm really interested for us to watch this beat the presenter because I really want to question people about this particular decision in this hand and what people would do. And you can email and text us in and let us know what you would do and what you think. So it'll be very interesting. Um, so it's an interesting one. Um, but we are heading to a break now. Um, so enjoy the paper news. And Dr Tom and the Night Nurse, will we turn to your screens um, for a bit of beat the presenter after this. So we'll see you then. Morning. Welcome back to Poker Night Live. It's a Dr. Tom and Night Nurse special. <clears throat> I know that you thoroughly enjoyed the last hour with wonderful commentary from the doc himself. I was playing Beat the Presenter, which we're going to go straight to and see how I did. And there is an interesting ending to this, uh, which I want your comments on. So, um, 
we talked about it in the break, haven't we? Mm -hmm. um, but we'll have a look, and it'll be a good idea to see what the viewers think. Mm -hmm. Do remember the text number is 84222. Text the word poker and your question or comment to 84222. There it is. And any bluff stories you may have. You've been a bit rubbish with the bluffing <laughs> stories tonight, I have to say. Not very good, ladies and gents. Guys and girls. And the email, poker at pokernightlive.co.uk as well. Um, so do remember to get any questions and queries in or comments you have at the game that's about to be played by moi. I think it's $30, um, which I thought was a $20, but it's a $30 sit and go tournament. So let's go straight there. Bring it on. Through the matrix. And so whose name are you playing under? Chipness. Yes. Mine. I don't steal other people's names. I, I can't get into name, my I've got account. Money I can't get in. Account to be able to play. All the money they put in is still there. <laughs> we still can like quite get it up. It's too exciting because it's my tournament. But um, the reason that I use my own account is because I have money still in my account. Unlike some people. <laughs> and right, we're getting there now. <laughs> I've got money. This is slanderous. <laughs> I just can't get into it. <laughs> it's like those people you see uh, with the. Um, the signs outside, big on the street, saying I'm a millionaire, but I can't get into my bank account. Well, look, King Queen is what are you reigns do with it? in the land of the unraised pot, so I'm going to limp and hope that I'm not raised behind me. You believe this spin from James Browning? Well, no, it's proved time and time again. What? It's proved by what? There's some poker by theory. The, if it's raised, it's generally by a better king or queen, mm. and then you bet when you hit your king and queen and lose. You don't play in the games I play in. Um, but of course, Jack's going to raise it up and then we'll have to put it down. Let's have a big hello to everyone first. We've got Snuggy Bug, top right. We've got McTish, The Kitty Kid, Eagles, JWC, Prestonian, me, Chip Nurse, and Joe and Harren. Nice odds there, though. Look, you, I would have been winning. You're going uh, four to one to call. You're not tempted? I was tempted, but I kept thinking of that phrase. And James always has such a go at me when I don't abide by his rules, so I put it down. Well, I would never go at you if you didn't abide by his rules. <laughs> or indeed never mine. You've been programmed. So look, I'll put it down, I would have been, <laughs> been programmed by James Browning. <laughs> yeah. It's got into your head and rewired things. It's extraordinary. It's terrible, isn't it? He's an evil genius. Could have won some money there. Let's have a look. I'm sure it's going to an ace or a jack will come and it will be a very moral story. Let's hope so. Ooh, he always put it down. Ah. Look, queens and fives, I would have been happy enough with that as well. Mm, good move from JW. It? Well, never mind. Pair of twos for Snuggy Bug. It's going to be interesting. Uh, yeah, and Ham rebates me at one point, and I had to go at him. So it would be good to see what he had. Do you really think he cares? He did. What about he you having a go? He should have put it down because I had a monster, so he did the right thing. So uh, let's okay. see if he's lying through his teeth and he had nothing. He's probably cackling away at the thought of having his charade exposed on TV. <laughs> well, I'm going to raise and re-raise. Raise Beatty. Re-raise by 60. I thought the re-raise was a minimum of previous raise. That's not right, is it? I didn't see what happened there, Michelle, but if there's several people in the pot, you don't have to raise more than the largest of the raises. OK, because, yeah, because a kid, a kid put in 80... Mm -hmm. So from 20, that's 60, mm -hmm. and then he get eagles, it went up to 140. Sounds about right to me then. Okay, so just re-raise the original raise? Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. I always thought the re-raise had to be a minimum of previous raise. Well, if it's 20 with 60, which is 80, then the guy's got to put an 80 again with 60, which will be 140. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense to me. <laughs> Well, I'm sure the software doesn't, doesn't occasionally say, ah, oh, no, go on, put in a minimum raise. <laughs> ah, go on. Ace Jack, King Jack, Ace Four. What are the hands you desire, Michelle? You have none of them. So, because the kid put in... Because Eagle's put in 140, I could then raise it to 200. Uh, yeah. OK. How odd that I wasn't clear on that point. Well, you're always learning months. things in poker. I'm still learning things. Yeah. Are you? Do you learn from me? Yeah. 
Learn not what not to do. <laughs> I learned to fold King Queen when I get in four to one. <laughs> well, we can see there's no hearts, but it's a bit scary for the others out there. Terrifying. McTish decides to find out where he is, and it's difficult for anyone to. Whew, I'll eat my words. It's easy wow. for someone to raise with nothing. That was a ballsy raise from Dikidikid. Kid. Worked very nicely. Mm. Looked like a little bit of a hero on tel national telly. Got a queen three. I don't even bother with the extra 20. What a rock. 2-7, load of rubbish. Not much at all on this table, really. Yeah, it's got about the best with the king 10. I don't think you're going to give that up. Yes, you do. He takes it down. Takes it down. Ace eight for Yoan Harren. Pair of flies for JWC. What does he do? He's limping. I can't see that there's going to be a raise with these hands. We've got three player pots and uh, fives still currently in the lead. That's a scary flop for a pair of fives. Bear in mind he's got an under pair. Under pair? Sounds a bit rude. <laughs> Not really. Is this your dirty little mind, Doctor? Yes, it is my dirty <laughs> little mind, Doctor. <laughs> well, moves, not much going on really at the moment. Some rag aces here. I think I play this just because I'm bored. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I think I do. Surely I think I'm nuts. bored, so I feel I'll limp in and try and hit some diamonds. <laughs> You're fairly live. <laughs> And it's only 20. I thought, no, I'll give it a bash. No, nothing. You got a diamond? I've got a backdoor flush draw. Yes, you do. Got a backdoor straight draw. You're the sole owner of an ace. You're not in terrible shape. Yes, but I know I'm the sole owner of an ace. Ah, well, yeah. There is a premium on knowing where you are in poker. Yes. And if, if, if let's say, let's say we knew what the cards were. Let's say we knew that these two had a pair of kings, and I have something like an ace, I was about to say ace-queen, but I have two over cards, one of them being an ace. Um, if they bet, it's still not correct for me to call, even if I can see the cards, is it not? Well, you can't have two over cards. You can only have one over card. Okay, well, let's say I've got an ace, because some people still do call with the ace. So they've got ace-jack. They'd, if, even if they can see the other person's got a pair, they'd, they'd still call because they think it, they might hit their ace and win. But that wouldn't be right, would it? Well, it depends on the pods. You, you need to know how likely you are to hit your ace, and the chance of hitting it on the next card is six is uh, um, 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 six percent. Yeah. So uh, you need odds of something like fifteen to one. An odd is about four percent, isn't it? An out, sorry. <laughs> 4% hit it by the river, but 2% hit it on the next card. Okay. 4-5. 4-8. Oh. No, for Prestonian. Yeah, well, your hand, chip nurse. My hand was a 4-8. Hmm. Not really very connected. It's so interesting to watch um, a game back, because you, you think about in your head what you think people have, and it's very interesting to see if you were right or not. And how right have you been so far? Very right. Oh. 
spot on. Snivy Berg looking to take this down now. He'll be raised and find out where he is. Ace five. Cool, we can see that all four aces are in their pockets. All of them extremely raggy. Five, six, seven, eight are the rags. <laughs> it's almost a straight. <laughs> Oh, 7-10 suited. Who can resist its lure? It's such an evil hand. Why is he playing it? No one can resist it, Michelle. Only I can resist it. I can, <clears throat> I can resist it. We're immune to it because we see it so often played on Poker Night Live. Oof. Oof. And he, yeah, and Aaron absolutely must fold this. It's such a bad hand and... Oh, now what about the A6 here? That's a pretty bad call, is it not? Yeah, it's just as bad, really. And Haran's now getting some odds, but I still feel he can let it go. Oh, it's called. What's he calling for? It's such an awful hand. Hmm. Yep. And it doesn't... Oh, I, I wouldn't even think for a second to even play 10 7 no. at all in any situation. No. I mean, it doesn't always win when it makes a flush, and it very rarely makes a straight. And even then, it's in the danger zone, because once the 8 9 jack comes, well, people are going to have higher straight draws, so it's a very dangerous hand. I think you're bonkers So you can only bluff with it then. Let's think that's what he's hoping to do. Well. So Matisha's already got in there. Yeah, lots of flops are going to come down where it's just impossible to bluff. Mm, very odd, Johan. Madness, madness. Ten seven suited madness is what I call it. Jack eight, rubbish. Yeah, pretty filthy hand. Blinds to battle it out. Ooh. Ooh la la. Big hand for JWC. Top pair and a flush draw. Mm-hmm. Absolutely he's... nothing for eagles, though. Pretty much free rolling against a better ace, which is unusual. If his opponent's got something like ace seven, then Eight. JWC is, is really pretty much free rolling because he's going to either split it, probably, or... He's going to make his draw. Eagle's getting fruity with his eight. Oh, ho, ho. Ooh, ho, ho. unfortunate for JWC. Should yeah. have made it more expensive. But hindsight is a great thing. Well, it's not actually. I think he might make a value bet here. I wouldn't. I wouldn't blame him for making a value bet, and he does. River ratted by the eagle. And eagles makes a little value raise, and JWC calls just in case he's going to get pushed off a split pot. Nasty situation. I've had more rubbish, 5-2. Well, you had the queen king. You didn't play it. Yeah, to a raise. Getting 4-1 from the... All in the land of the unraised pot. Well, not he has... You're right, he has programmed you. What else has he got you to do for him? <laughs> cups of tea? I'm not allowed to talk to the people I'm playing with. <laughs> because I've got to concentrate. Well, a sourpuss. I mean, I don't... <laughs> I don't talk to them, but that's up to me. <laughs> don't you? Anyway, you're you were tapping boring. away. I know, I do with it when I'm with everyone but James. Oh. It's not like chatting. It's mm. half of it, isn't it? The social side of things. I'm sure he's not such an ogre. This is um, interesting, so we've got the flush drop against the top pair. Yeah, don't forget the gut shot. We've got gut shot straight for the king. But he's not... Is he getting onto the call there? Well, the trouble with two pair there, which is what Bug's got, is it can turn into a house. But basically with 12 outs, you're very close to getting pod odds to make it on the next card. And it's going to cost him even more now. If you face a pot size bet. And he calls it. Mmm. No, I wouldn't have called 500. He also knows there's just a possibility that Snuggy Bug is playing something like a king and that if he catches a jack or a queen, they're going to win it for him as well. But he correctly folds on the river. I don't think Johan Haran played it terribly. No. He might have semi-bluffed and gone for a raise, got himself a bit of fold equity. Jacks.
Got the nines as well. So let's have a look at what Prestonian does here. We can see he's very dominated by the jacks. He wants to really be raising with the nines rather than calling, doesn't he? Mm. So he, I'm sure he'd rather raise that up than have to be the one calling it. Yeah, I don't know what to do there. I might have to let them go. Not very helpful comment, is it, from the expert? No. A tricky decision, should we say. If he raises... But was I right, though, with saying that you'd, you, with the nines you'd much rather be the one putting in the bet and hoping everyone else will fold rather than having to decide whether to call a raise from somebody else? Yeah, but given someone has raised, the question is, do you call or do you raise? Yes, but I'm just putting it in different content. Well, no, but you seem to be saying you want to be the initial raiser, yeah. which is all very well. But if you can't well, be... Well, it's all very well, and that's all I need from you, Doc. Thank you very much. Well, no, I'm just trying to investigate the city, <laughs> Michelle. I mean, let's say you've been raised, to put it into the context of I'd you. I'd put them down, but that's because I'm, we all know how tight I am. Yeah, I might put them down. <laughs> that's because you've taught me. <laughs> Depends who it is. Basically, if it's a nutter, I might just go with it. Uh, if it's a maniac, fair enough. You've been programmed by five different or six different Poker Night Live presenters. For nearly a year now. Can mm. you believe it's been that long that we've known each other, Doc? Um, How we bonded. <laughs> seems longer. <laughs> that very first week. Where I learned all about poker. In a week? Yep. We some teachers, aren't we? Oh, we just missed a really big raise from Yeo and Harren, which was a bluff. I'll tick it off. Tick it off. It was a bluff. A of rubbish for me again. Oh, Eagle's trying to limp, and uh, if Prestonian doesn't raise, which is unlikely, you'll see a cheap flop, but I think Prestonian must bet here. And 250 is good for me here. Not sure what the dwell up is in aid of. Oh, 120. About the pot. Ah, much less than the pot. About half the pot. In fact, even less than 40, that. 40, 80, 120, 160 was the pot. Yeah, but he's putting 40. He's putting 120. Which makes the pot bigger. And then he's putting only an, a raise of 80. It's a tiny raise. Oh, uh, yeah, for, of course, you look at it in the correct way. I look at it in the full amount way, which is bad, wrong of me. So, unsurprisingly, he's got two callers. And now what? That board doesn't look like it would have helped that many people. Of course, an eight is a possibility from a calling hand, but it's just that bit much less likely when there's two of them. I think that's a nice bet from JWC because he's read it just as you did, in that with the raise, pre-flop and the calls, it's unlikely anyone has a five or an eight in their hand. So the only thing he, that's beating him is an overpair or, or a pair in their hand. So I think that's a nice bet from JWC, do you think? It is, and a string sort of way is in an ideal situation there, because he, he's not last to bet and where it looks like a really smelly bluff. He's not first to bet where he doesn't, he's got minimum information about the players behind him, but he's, he's just got one player to push out there, Prestonian. Oh, you've got an ace jack. What are you going to do with it? Going to bet. How much? <gasps> Yo and Harren is a cheeser. This is where he re-raised me. Big, fat cheeser, Johan. Re raising me with the fives. I'm going to get you. I think there's a lot of sexual chemistry developing between you two. Look at him. He makes me put that down. I mean, I know he's a head pre flop, but still. I thought he had ace queen or ace king or a high pocket pair. I don't know why. That's just what I thought. And I should know, be I should know better with Johan as well. I should have at least called. In fact, yeah. I should have re raised and then seen what he did. Yeah, if you go all in, he folds. Damn it. Oh well, he had the better hand. And then he comes up telling me it was a good fold because he had a monster. <laughs> well, I'm annoyed, Johan. I can't remember if I got him back. Let's see if, we, if you're on tilt then with the ace fold. <laughs> He could have easily had it, had a big, bigger hand. And to be fair, the way I looked at it was, my thinking was, I hadn't played in ages, and I'm raising um, for the first time. So I thought he must think I have something because I've raised. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he must have a good hand to re-raise me. Perfectly reasonable logic. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Unless he thought that you would think that. Yeah. Mm, cunning devil. He is. Blind still at 2040 in this super slow structure. Mm. Get a bit of a longer game. And uh, Kitty Kid should take this one down. Really. What do you think of the uh, small blind steel? Um, well, it's not really a steel. Ace nine's almost certainly a head. So I quite like it. Okay. Now we've got ace eight on the small blind. Well, let's see if uh, if he gives it a go now. Unless you put in a little inspired raise here with four five off. No, you don't. <laughs> no, but I am thinking of because I'd just done the ace jack. I thought I wouldn't bother, but I am thinking about trying to do do a bluff because we were talking about bluffs. But then everyone in the, the chat box like telling me that I should bluff because we're talking about bluffs, and I thought, wait, well I can't now, can I? Now they've said because I'm just going to get called or re-raised. Well, these are the trials and tribulations of being the presenter. I <laughs> know. Oh, That's not fair. Two pair, mm. nice for eagles. Can't get a customer. Doesn't have to be too wide either, other than the flush draw. Ooh la la, queen to the kitty kid and king jack suited in the big blinds. And if kitty kid puts in 120, he might get a customer. But I think only a loose player would call that for a four times the big blind raise. Let's have a look. There it is, four times the big blinds. And it is a fold, and quite wise too. Yeah, King Jack's a bit of an iffy, iffy one, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty... I mean, if it's a big volume pot there with lots of players, you can play it because you've got straight and flush possibilities, but you've probably don dominated. Yeah, Snaggy Bug's been very quiet. I'm not surprised to see him decide to make a move. Joan Harren, who's the main uh, loose player, is out of the pot. Although we have seen JWC uh, giving it some. And he attacks your big blind. How do you feel about that? I tell him off. Mm -hmm. I get him back, don't worry. No. Ace Jack for McTish. 140, 150, 160, 120, 160. Oh, we've got a few suit aces here. We've got the ace jack and the ace whatever he had. Then we had ace five for Bristonian. Oh, five ten, I'm getting such a load of rubbish. Threes for JWC, worth a limp. Mm. Or not bother. Limps. Well, you could go to the razor, I suppose, if you've been a bit quiet. JWC? Yeah, maybe. Up and a downer for Prestonian. And a paired board, which is generally good when you hold a pair, but with two opponents and those rather scary uh, cards, I think JWC might just let this one go. Although, if Smooth Bug checks here. He might, he might legitimately have a go at this, representing a king and uh, pretending that he was worried of the queen, and that's what he's done. He knows that if his opponents don't have a pair, they really can't call, so in a sense he's just betting the value of his hand, and he's uh, played that with some savviness. Ace 10 now for JWC. Let's have a quick look at some pre-flop folds. Let's see if you're a rock. I think you are. Oh my god, what a rock. <laughs> look at I that. I haven't had anything look though. I've had like 95%. two hands. What, it's just as pure And the one time skill. I raised, I got re-raised by stupid fives. And they're all telling me that have I was going to bluff. Have, has anyone seen 95% ever on this draw? <laughs> yeah. We've only just started. It's we haven't remarkable. been playing that long. There is. Yeah, I don't know who programmed you. Was it James? How many hands? About 60 hands. 
about 30 hands. Mm. But to be fair, I've had absolute rubbish. And the one time I did bet, I got re-raised. And oh. I knew that I couldn't, I knew I had to wait for the hand because they were all in the chat box saying I was going to bluff. Mm -hmm. I figured, okay, fair enough, I'll wait till I've got the hands. I think you're absolutely right, Michelle. Thank you, Doc. Still 95. <laughs> yeah, but I get into it. I've got plenty of play left. You're right. Johan was having a go at me saying, blah, blah, de, blah, blah, you haven't played anything. I said, yeah, but I'm like fifth and you're eighth. <laughs> <laughs> Touché. <laughs> so I've got a 9-10. I'll put it down. I could have played there. But because there was a raise before me, I thought I wouldn't bother. Well, what are these desperados going to get up to? The kitty kitty knows he's got to take this with a bluff he's, if he's going to take it, and I think that might take it. JWC with no draw. Doesn't make an inspired re raise. So the kitty takes it. Look, see, rubbish. Can't play with that. Chipnow's going to fold her suited cards, I think. See, in tournaments, you get a lot of people that say, if you haven't had any cards, you have to forget about what cards you've got and just play every now and then. For me, it's all about when you get the feeling. And if I don't get the feeling to play, I won't. And it sounds stupid, but it is what I do. And unless I start getting desperate, which I'm nowhere near at the moment, I've got plenty of play left. I don't need to get jiggy with bad cards just yet. I've got plenty of time just to sit there and wait for a while. I absolutely agree with you, Michelle. People say, you haven't played for ages, you should be making a bet. Well, no, I shouldn't. I don't need to do anything right now. When the blinds go up again, I'll start thinking about it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Move when you feel the time is right, not before. Blinds are 40 80 now, though. And Michelle has played 5% of her hands. <laughs> I'm going to stick a pen in here in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's changed now. Because I think I just... Oh, I didn't... I'll play one in a minute. OK. You promise? Yeah. I've had rubbish. Mm -hmm. Even I nearly thought about it with the Queen 4 and thought that. Ah, I see. Yeah, and was trying to get under your skin there. And he was trying to plant ideas in your mind of moving with things like Queen 4, but you resisted his yes, evil... Yes, I resisted his evil thought suggestion. Evil Johan, as he's now going to be known. JWC making a move there against Johan Haran, and he's picked the right opponent. I don't think he'll fold this for a re-raise. And Johan Haran knows that, so Johan Haran's got no fold equity and lets JWC pick it up. And nicely played. Look, I've got a 9-10. Aye. So I've decided to play. Oh, look, run into aces. <laughs> That's a bit of a weedy raise. Yeah, well, I thought it'd be enough because I haven't played for so long. Fair enough. Yeah, you probably... The good thing about the raise, though, is that if someone re-raises you, for the reasons you say, you can kind of read them as being strong. And because I haven't played for ages, I thought, right... I'm going to call this, and then whatever happens on the flop, I'm going to try and bluff it and try and take it down. Obviously, I don't know who's sitting there with aces, but... Da -da 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 -da. Mm. Three nines. Ha-ha, snuggly bug. That's for stealing my blind earlier. You see, some people here, Michelle, would say lucky fish. No, skillful. I picked the right moment to play mean? with my nine... What do you mean you picked the right ten. moment? <laughs> I got the feel. You got the feel? Got the bab. Mm. So now, of course, I'm not putting it down for anything. So I did a little cheeky check. Cheeky check? Cheeky check. And you've been bet at. And I, I thought I'll have a little a little thing cup here to try and feign. Yeah, I'm like, not too sure. I like the dwell-up. I like it a lot. And he, obviously he's not putting his aces and nines down. Yay! Patience is a virtue. Well done. See? Didn't need to play any nasty three-fives and... Ten twos. No, you chip leader. Lovely juggly. A little bit lucky, maybe, but uh, fair enough, I think. Yeah, and you got the maximum. Sorry, Snuggy. I'm not. But isn't it funny how still, all this time later, when I'm all in with somebody, my heart still goes a little bit. 
Pitter patter. Yeah, when you oh. when you end up all in and with somebody. Ah. Oh. Excitement of poker. Not much out there. Queen King? You're just in Queen King again. Well, it's the uh, ruler of the unraised pot. McTish is raised. What a boy. Should take us down, unless Johan Haran has a, a bit of a wobbly. He doesn't. And chip nurse. Queen 10 suited on the button. I thought about a steal, but... Uh... You just... Been revealed to stealing with nine's head against Snuggy Bug and decided not to well, make his big Well, because I just played in a hand, I thought I won't bother getting involved. Because all that stuff does make a difference. It does. But I did anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes you've got to be an intuitive player. But it's a pretty weedy steal. <laughs> I thought steal. I'd put that down. I must be thinking about um, a different a different hand. Because I had Queen Ten before on the button. Then I put it down, or but maybe it was after. You deserve this, because it just looks like you're taking the, the Michael, because you've raised the minimum, and you've put him into a situation, basically, where you've, you've rattled his ego, because you're asking him to lay down. <laughs> you're asking to lay down for a minimum raise. <laughs> and that's a really insulting thing to do to this guy, so of course he's going to raise you. There you go, I wanted to give him some of my chips, because I felt bad about taking all his Well, if that there. was your plan, Michelle, you executed it very well. Yeah, okay. good. I think this is the one which is a little bit interesting. Oh, yeah. Well, I Looks think pretty dull goes so far. For a bluff. I might be wrong. He's certainly not betting for value. And he's got a gut shot and uh, a bit of evidence there that JWC doesn't have much. Too small. The guy's getting five to one to call. It was just too small, that bluff. But now he can bet. I'll put in a pot size bet here. 600 if I'm going to bluff. No. No, it wasn't that one, though. So we're still only at 40 80. It's all very exciting. No one out yet, as you can see. So how often do the blinds go up on these ones then? Every 12 hands. 12 hands, is it? Is it? Mm-hmm. Got shot for JW. Not much at all for Eagles. Got shot. Three required. Enough to call. I think Patrick Antonius is watching tonight. Mm. He's probably too busy writing love poetry to you. <laughs> I hope so. Well, we've got Ace Jack, the 910 might have a go. Well, I'd be rude not to. Ah, that changes things. Yeah, now what? I think you've got to let it go. I don't like it. Not he's, the ace jack. Doesn't know what, he, where, what he's getting into. Doesn't know if it's a pair, ace queen, ace king. You've got to hit a jack. And, well, he's and gone up and down now. McTish, yep. And the kitty kid must play this for all his chips, and he's okay this time. And with 840 in the pot, and McTish with how much is it? 1300? Always giving him a cheap draw. He's giving McTish a very, very cheap price to draw to straight or the flush if he's got it. And McTish doesn't call, and that is interesting. He had uh, really only six safe outs, because two of his straight outs were spades, but probably the kiddie kid doesn't have a flush draw. 
I'm surprised you felt that. Ray's here from Snuggy. Just mm. minimum. Ah, he learned that from you. He did. And it's not good, Snuggy. It doesn't work. You need to do at least three times big blind to steal, really. It's true. Sometimes works with a min. No doubt my big blind's going to get stolen. <sighs> yep. Well, that gives you a bit of protection. I think Prestonian will still raise. He calls it the A3. They're all gagging to nick your big blind. They want a piece <laughs> of it. Now they realise they've got to play a pot against each other. Oof, Hello. Did you know something we didn't? Hello, Dolly. It's going to get very interesting if another club comes down. Well, it will, but they're a bit dead. Only six of them left in the deck. So, uh, round about three to one instead of the normal two to one. He was having a thank you. Wow. Great. Oh, he's making it cheap for them to draw. What is the logic? Of course someone's going to have a high club. Ooh! Wow. <laughs> silly, silly. Should have gone all Poor in. Poor old Prestonian's going to go out here, I have a feeling. And the king's there as well, so it's only the queen and the ace he's got to worry about. Yeah. Eagles has to worry now. Yeah, he, now he's made his mistake, he should check and fold. But you've got to protect a small flush. Oh, terrible play. Ugh. Hello. <laughs> another flush. Oh, I thought for a minute he had the straight flush, but... Three, five, six, seven. Oh, it's a shame the four didn't come. Well, I said the clubs were a bit dead. Well, he has to call now because the king's on the board. So he's got a king flush. And uh, Dickie Dickie takes two out. Puts wow. him hugely into the lead. You've got to protect a small flush on the flop, folks, because another club comes, another card of that suit, you're probably dead. And Eagles just got, grilled, got greedy there. There it is, post-mortem on the flop. So, we've, the blind's gone up to 8160, and we've had our first casualties. But I'm second. So I'm quite happy. I'm still looking forward to the kind of finale bit, because I want to get your opinions of the hand. Fast forward. <laughs> oh, not much going on here. Oh, is Aaron thinking about moving all in? No. Ace two off, pretty horrible. Snuggy bug throws it away. McTish. Yeah, difficult here. Put in a reasonable sort of raise to nick the big blind. He's probably going to find himself committed to the pot. I think he might have to let it go. Yeah, he's decided to call instead. I don't mind that, actually, in that situation because you really can't find the right price to raise with. Because the kiddie kid's going to put him all in probably anyway if he's got anything half decent. And Tish will have to call. And I think he should bet here. Because uh, the kiddie kid's probably just going to have two overcards. McTish having called is in better position to represent two better overcards. And kiddie kid must fold. Oi, great read from the man there. Very nice read and he's representing there a pair or a two and he's hoping McTish has just got high, high cards to call with. He reckons McTish would have raised pre-flop with a pair, uh, gone all in with a, with a medium sort of pair, and I think that's a great read from Dickity Kid. Well played, and it goes down in the bluff column. It's a lovely little bluff chart you have there, down there, Doc. Mm -hmm. Thanks, I knocked it up. Well, look, I've made it 320 with my pair of fives. <gasps> I think he bullies me off this. Big fat bully. He checks. So I bet. 3.20. He calls. And now I'm worried. 
So I check it, and then he gets his turn. I should have bet again. On the turn? Yeah, but because I bet and he called, I thought, hmm, what's he calling with? So I got a little bit worried when the Queen come. And of course, I, I ran away. Run away. Stupid fives. Johan got me earlier with the fives. Oh, my unlucky hand of the game. You make a good fold on the river, but why are you betting so little? You've, all you've done is minimum raises all night, Michelle. I know. But what, what's your logic? There isn't any. Oh, OK. <laughs> Sorry. I usually raise more. I'm just a bit, bit passive tonight. I'm in a passive mood. Oh, yeah. I'm trying to change my play. I was quite aggressive last time I played, so I'm going for the passive option. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which we all know is wrong. It's good to teach the viewers. A bit more aggression, I would have taken that pot down before. Mm, on the flop. But the problem with it is that you start betting so much on such a mediocre hand. Yeah, well, there's always risk, but it was quite a nice flop for a pair of fives. Yeah. Should have bet more. Tish is out, chipness makes a straight. So anyway, I have really thought about calling him there, because he only had 700, even though 700 was a lot to me, I thought, look, he's desperate. He's going to be going in with a lot of worse hands than King-Queen. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I called. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. Absolutely. So back up to where you were. And down to five. And you've got 20 big blinds, Michelle, so you're all right. Yep. And you've also got th two relatively short stacks. You kind of want there to be three short stacks here so you can get into the, uh, the money more easily. And that's good enough for me to attack Snuggy Bug with, I think. But JWC gets in there first. Yeah, I would have uh, gone for a steal there. Oh. With the Queen turn. You and Haran calls. Whew. Great, it's worked out perfectly for him. Now he can uh, give JWC a chance to bluff at him, which he should do. Jay, he's got two overcards there, he really should, should bet. And uh, now must call in case Johan Haran was trapping just for the single seven. It's all Good over house. from JWC, yeah. Johan Haran doubles through. JWC now suddenly the short stack himself. Kitty Kid calls, misses, difficult to represent a jack here, difficult to bet. I think he's going to have to surrender the initiative to JWC, and he does. Yeah, he doesn't want some sort of re-raise bluff. Well played. Massive chip lead there, do Kitty Kid's got. Huge chip lead. Could have action here though. If Kitty Kid gives uh, JWC has no fold equity left now, he's kind of got to fold it. If Kitty Kid had made a smaller bet, no, I don't like the raise. Well, he's lucky at the moment. It works. Well, and it boom. works. I want them to go out. But just like Dan Matanak said earlier in this uh, this situation, you kind of got to fold there unless there's some chance your opponent will fold when you raise him. She'll be blind again. Yeah, but with an 8 2, I thought I'm not even going to bother. Well, I can re raise him or call him, try and hit something, but I can't be bothered. Oh. <laughs> I thought about trying to steal it from Johan, but because it's Johan, I didn't bother. Mm. Yeah, that is the thing. Well, Snuggy Bug might make a stand here. Let's see. 240 in the middle. Ah. That makes it more difficult to make a stand. Yes, he does. I don't really blame him. 
to be honest. But he's unfortunately got nobbled. Go on. Yay, it's the bubble. Boo, I'm losing. <laughs> Still, you've got uh, now, uh, now only 10 big blinds. Blinds have gone up. Yeah, so I'm. Uh, blinds have gone up, so I know that. Uh, I need not to be so picky. Yeah, and suddenly you're down one of the short stacks. And then I get 610, which I'm really happy about. Are you? So you let it go. So now I've only got two eight. And all of a sudden you start thinking, God, I really don't have many chips at all. King five. It's rubbish. These two aren't going to get too jiggy with each other because they're the two chip leaders. Yeah, that might well cause them to cool off a bit. The goody kid can bet here. Yes. Yeah. Board. And it'll be interesting to see if he checks here. A value bet is an order. Yeah, he does make one. He's not so cautious. He doesn't try and cream off another 1,200 from Johan Haran. He might have a worse ace. And Haran going to fold, I'm sure. Yep. The kid again takes it down. And you're on the button. I've got a 4 7 suited. Mm -hmm. I'm not happy. You're not happy. We, we know you're going to steal, but JWC got in there first. Yeah. I think the hand's coming up, though, that I was telling you about that I'm very excited about. Hopefully it'll be the next one. Yeah, JWC makes a stand. I don't blame him. And you and Harry are now going to have to call in case JWC has made a stand. I don't think he can fold here. He's getting two to one. And uh, even if he's up against a better race, he's not far off three to one. And of course, he may be ahead. He did put in the chat box, I should call this, I should call this. If it's but then a fold. Folded. Yeah, it's a bubble fold. Yeah. It's a bubble fold. I think he's probably regretting the original race, but oh, he had we're to. running out of time. I hope this next hand is the hand. Oh, no. It's oh, yeah, this one. is it. Three six. <laughs> three six, that's the one. The kitty kid puts in a raise and I put it down. Well, that's right. We'll have a look at your Off. magical hand later. No, I want to see it now. Come on, quickly. But to get the full benefit of uh, the analysis required, we'll have to show it after the break anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're going to have to, because we've only got a minute left. JWC thinks he's got four outs for a straight. He's wrong. Two of them are into Kitty Kid's hands. And uh, Kitty Kid's in excellent shape. Should have called. Cool. Oh, would have been in the money. Cool. Right, well, the hand, I think, is the next hand, which we want analysis on from you guys at home. Um, we've spoken about it. I <laughs> know I think I did right. Um, but what do you think? I've got some emails here as well from some of the guys that were in that tournament as well. So I'll do them after we've watched it, I think. Mm -hmm. um, do remember those details. You can text, um, type the word poker, and then your question to 84222. Here it comes. It's four for a pound. And you can also email poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go to a break now, and then afterwards we'll just watch the end of that tournament, and we'll watch the hand that um, we're intrigued um, to see what you would do um, on the situation. And then we'll have the final table of our multi-table tournament, which will be very exciting, because we did watch a bit of that earlier. And we do follow that throughout the whole night. So we will be watching um, the final table of the multi-table tournament to take us to the end of the show. And that is all we've got time for for now. But don't go anywhere because we've got all that excitement coming up after the break. So we'll see you then. Good morning and welcome to Poker Night Live. It's a Dr. Tom and Night Nurse special. Without any further ado, we're going to go straight to the end of that tournament because I know you all can't wait to see the hand I'm talking about. I'm sure it's coming so up next. So, do we assume you go out in the sand because you sort of... Yeah. This isn't it. Ah, it's Queen King. What did I do? I raised it. I must have. Stick it all in. 960 I made it. Mm. What do you do if he, re if he raises you? I'm all in, aren't I? This is the hand. Look, 
I think we better have this uh, on a repeat mode. I put in 960. Mm. With the, I'm going to go all in anyway. I want to call. The kitty kid goes all in, right? So the only thing they're being me with it. So does Joe Swing. I call now. This is the problem because people are saying that I shouldn't have called. It was very unfortunate that the Queen comes. Unlucky. But in that situation that I'm in, fair enough. If I fold, one of them is hopefully going out, right? Hopefully, one of them's going out and I'm going to take third. Let's get that back up. Now, that's not saying that one of them, that's not saying that JWC is going to go out. JWC may not go out. He may win. Yeah, and he there's may still have four queen. of us left. Now, I've got a pair of kings. The only thing that's beaten me with a pair of aces, which is unlikely. Um, so I've got to put them on a pocket pair, which means I'm beating them, or a high ace, which means I'm still beating them and I'm in good stead to take it down. And in the long run, I will take it down. So if I fold, there's no guarantee that someone's going to go out and I'm going to hit the money anyway. So I have to call, surely. You do. I don't know if they... <laughs> I don't know if they were just winding you up in the in the chat box, but I mean, if they genuinely think you should fold there, then they're on, they're on some different planet. The only situation where you can fold those kings is when you're in a super satellite for, um, say, tickets for another event, and all three finishers get the same prize. There you can probably fold it, but even then it's a bit difficult. To be honest, by, by folding there, you throw away about three times out of four you're going to win that pot, and you'll win a massive pot put you in great stead to win the whole comp. And the amount you throw away, uh, the chance of winning first place you basically throw away by folding there, massively outweighs the very, very few times where you get bubbled. I personally think it's unfair that we have to split third winnings. Yeah, I'm surprised by that. Most, uh, most places don't do that. But obviously on this site, normally, then the guy who's got the most chips of the two that get bubbled um, gets third place. Um, Didn't you do the percentages on that hand? Mm, yeah. I was 73% in Something, favour, wasn't I? Yeah, 73%. See? Let's go back to the game. Shall I do the email from Double Top, though, because, about that hand? Or should we just, should we just watch the end first? <laughs> and Because uh, Double Top, bless his heart, Double Top. Like, he had a go at me, didn't you? Did he? He said it was a bad call, and I, I told you that it wasn't. I and we had a little bit of an argument. Bananas, if he thinks it was a bad call. Your bananas, DT. Ha! Well, let's just watch the end of this and then we'll do the emails. But it was a very interesting hand. What would you have done in that situation? 84222 on the text and poker at pokernightlive.co.uk on the email. What would you have done? Would you have folded it hoping to um, jump into third, but even though there's no guarantee? Or would you, of course, call for your chips there? One way to look at it is the difference between coming fourth and third is, is 20%, because 20% of the prize money goes to fourth. The difference between, no, between coming... Fourth is bubble. You don't get anything, do you? Sorry, between... No, that's right. The difference between coming fourth and third is 20%, because you get 20% for thirds. Oh, right, OK. But you don't get anything for fourth. Well, just hear me out, Michelle. <laughs> you're just confusing me. But, well, you're confusing me. <laughs> but the difference between third and first is 30%, because it's 50% to the winner. So... Yeah. That's the bubble you're interested in. Effectively, though, if you double through, if you triple through with the kings, then uh, you put yourself in great shape to take first place, and you throw it away if you put the kings down. So I didn't get Johan back anyway, but I will do. Give me time. You might have to call here. Yeah, difficult one. Depends on how much fold equity he thinks he's got left with his stack. Who? Johan. He hasn't he... got any fold equity, has he? No, but if he lets this one go, oh, okay. how much fold equity does he get on the next movie mix? Well, it's got to be this one, and I think he has to push. No, he folds. That's interesting. A uh, horrible kicker there, but the Queen is probably ahead, and there's so much money in the pot. Oh, well, he's lucky he's got an A6. It's nicely in front of the 8 and 9. And leaves himself 190. Just for luck. Oh dear. Now he needs an ace. And must call. And only the ace is good. There it is, he's out. 
That's the end. I should have been with the winner. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid trip queens. Okay, well, when did we fold? You folded most of the time. 57 hands out for Chip Nurse. And 10% uh, she folded pre flop, 5% post flop. Hmm. What does that mean? I don't know, because you fold a lot more than 10% pre flop. I haven't got a clue what that means. <laughs> That's including the blinds. <laughs> Oh, I was hoping we are going to have a chip movement graph then. Oh, not... where's the chip movement it's graph? so exciting. Right, well, look, double top. Uh, OK, what does he, he say? I, I called him said... bananas a minute ago, didn't I? <laughs> he did, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, he says, hi, Michelle and Dr Tom. When the chip leader, the kiddie kid, put everyone all in and JWC calls, then you have to fear that one has aces or ace king. What? You were last to act. You have to fold if the kitty kid beats JWC. You get third and maybe more. Okay, if your king sold up, then you are in the last three. That's the same if the chip leader wins the hand. I put kings down when I'm third to act. If you were second, then you could call. It's down to position. This is a great question. What does Dr. Tom think? I think you, you're so paranoid about SDT. You must think the CIA is spying on you. I mean, everyone's short stacked there. In fact, the situation that's most likely here is, is when um, chip leader puts a big ace in, puts all his chips in, that he's got a big ace, and the guy who calls has got an ace, which means that there's two aces dead. There's only two more left in the deck for the kings to worry about. It's an absolute ideal situation. In fact, the bet and the call there, I'm loving it. I'm absolutely loving it. I don't think even twice before sticking it all in. Double top. You're wrong. Ha-ha. <laughs> um, we may have to start a thread on the forum for this play. Yes, let's. He, he says, well done, Michelle. Just because you play more, that doesn't mean you should win more, especially when you know everyone is out to beat you. That's true. Thank you very much. He says, um, also, P.S., ace-king suited against ace-king offsuit. I don't think 53% to 48% stated by Dr. Torn when there was something like a 91% chance of a split pot. It was 7% for the suited against the 2% offsuit. Mm. I'm not quite sure what you're saying there, DT, but we'll run it through a poker calculator and then we'll know. Thank you, DT. I also have um, an email here from Snugglebug. So we'll do Snugglebug, sorry, from the same game. He says, Hey, Michelle and Doc, I think you did right to call with the Kings. With those two all ins in front of you, the worst you had to fear was aces, and you can beat those with a mere 9 10. Um, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's the third time running I've had aces busted in two days. What can I say? I told you I had the vibe. Don't be playing me when I've got the vibe. Did you tell them you had the vibe? Yep. Oh, well, more fool them for playing in those crappy aces then. Um, Snappy just emailed in saying, Tom, thanks for not telling people about my method. By all means, tell Michelle, though. I'm always willing to tell about the girlies. After you've told her, could you then please tell me, as I don't know what it is. <laughs> and yes, I think I do know what you're talking about. <laughs> I've forgotten. <laughs> Have you? I yeah. can't remember. Mm. I have an email here from Andy. He says, Hi, both of you. I played in the sitting game with Michelle tonight and I'm astounded I played so tight. 90% folds. Ah! I usually play much looser, but it was my first showing on TV, so the pressure must have got to me. Anyway, I'd like to know what you thought about the hand where two of us busted out. I was going to raise pre flop with my ace jack, but when I saw a raise come into me, I only called using the gap theory, having to play a stronger hand in front of the initial raiser. I respected the raise and only called, but in hindsight, I should have now re-raised to flush those two opponents out as I had the superior pre-flop hand. After that, it was all downhill. I was committed with my jack clubs and only two other cards in the deck could beat me. But unfortunately, one of the other guys had the ace. Anyway, do you think I should have played the hand different? I can't really remember, Andy. What it I do was remember, the one where there was a yeah, flush I remember the, the hand, but I was concentrating basically on the guy with the small flush who, who should have bet when he didn't. Um, I can't remember the amounts, the amounts involved, but you were, you were basically there. It was all about the clubs. You had the jack of clubs, so there's two higher clubs out there. Was there an ace on the board? There wasn't, was there? Uh, no, someone had the ace flush. No, but was there an ace on the board when? Uh, no, because uh, it was five flush, five clubs on the board. Right, no, but on the flop, oh. okay, well basically what we're saying here <laughs> is in that situation, if you don't have the ace, you don't have a decent made hand, they don't want to draw to the jack of clubs in that situation because it might not be a winner when you make it. So that, that's the way I see it. You need to be drawing to the nuts, really. 
Okay, I'm double tops email back saying, okay, I am bananas. I am just reduced to a crying baby. I'm You're sorry. still bullying when I don't play. I'm so sorry, double oh. top. It's a danger. People are going to be chucking away big pairs, you know, and we don't want that. Yes, double top. And come on, if you're going to tell me I've done something wrong, I've got to fight you to the death. Or, or hand it over to me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, and a quick email from James. He says, Hi, just a quick note on what you think of Poker Tracker if you haven't heard of it. It keeps all your stats and tells you all the info you need in each hand, lets you know what you win and lose, and at which games which cards have made you the most money and which have lost you money. It basically stores every bit of info you need for your game and any views on this. I find it excellent, it only costs $70, and I must admit it has made me quite a bit of money. I'd love to hear your views. Yeah, it's a terrific bit of software. I mean, it's incredibly uh, detailed, and of course, all, the whole story of your play is in there, so you can't hide for anything that's a leak or how much you're winning or losing, it's all in there and you can examine it to your, your profit by position, by cards, by street of the betting, so on and so on. It does also, of course, store that information on your opponents, so if you play against people regularly, then you get to see the cold hard facts of their play. Okay, we do have an email from Petronius, but it's a little long, so we'll do it a bit later over the game. And because we actually do have to get to our multi table mm. tournament, if you do have anything you'd like to get into us or any thoughts on that particular hand, the text is 84222, and the email is poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. There they are on your screens. Do remember to put the word poker first and then your question. There's email, that's free. And we're going to head straight over to our final table of the multi table tournament. Whoopee. We have a lot of excitement tonight, haven't we, Doc? We have, yeah. So, we've got Jester, we've got, ooh, we've got Mad Nev, we've got Kaffa Kaffa, we've got Daz, we've got West Ham, we've got Saf, Madangle, and Posh Boy. Mr. Posh at the top. And, uh, pretty short stack this bunch, aren't they, Michelle? Look at this. Lots of people here with 10 big blinds or fewer. So this could all, we could see some exits fairly soon. We might get this done and dusted by the uh, end of the night with a bit of luck. Yeah, we will do. <coughs> Kath, Kath, moving. Moving and shaking. Takes it down. Maybe looking to uh, establish uh, an image and a niche as a player who you need to get out of the way of. Ace King. Got an 8 9 here for Daz. You might think that it's worth 1600. I mean, it's still, it's a lot of his stack when he's got 5,000. Laura, Laura of his stack. I think Kaffa is a uh, check for coffee, isn't it? It's called Coffee Coffee. Is it? Hmm. Check for coffee. You're very knowledgeable of foreign language. Well, it's languages. Same, I don't know that many words in Czech. Do you not? No. So, how are we adapting our play now we've got to the final table? Well, that is one of the time-honoured questions about tournament strategy. What you must do is have a look at the tournament payout structure and look for any big discontinuities in it. So, if there's a big, big jump, that becomes another bubble, basically, and you might want to alter your play around about the bubble. But if there are no big jumps, and particularly if it follows the typical sort of uh, tournament structure payout where there's not really great sums of difference between position 8 and position 7 and position 6 and they start to quickly grow towards 3, 2 and 1. I think at this stage of the game you should be perfectly happy to stick your chips in if you've got the best of it or you think you've got the best of it and not hang around to eke out 10 more dollars by letting someone else get knocked out and in the process have your own stack dwindle away. King, Queen, what a hand. And Saf, as predicted, has made it through to the final, but also perhaps predictably, given he was playing a fairly safe game, is a little bit denuded of chips. 
and sitting there with what eight big blinds. Wow, Madnev makes a move, gets a call, and if Ham checks it, Madnev might wrongly pop in a continuation bet. Hey, well, he's got the nine. This is really dangerous for Madnev. Oh, that is an evil bet because it just looks like it can't be a king. I think Madnev might read that as a draw. I've got a horrible feeling he's going to call, and he has. Yeah, it just inspired a bit of reverse psychology from West Ham. Now he's worried about a flush, so it all goes in. And it gets called by Madnev. Yeah, well played. It was a nasty flop for Madnev, but I think West Ham played it very nicely. Well done, West Ham. There it is. Nines and Kings. Madnev felt we couldn't get away from it. So we've got a casualty. Did he make much money? I can tell you. There you come, 10th. Eighth. Eighth. Eighth is $39.60, which is not bad, considering it costs $10 to enter. And the dollar for the house. Yep. Mmm, look at this coffee coffee. Coffee coffee ahead, and five would spell danger, because it would make coffee coffee the straight, but just the better one. And it's just going to be checked, and uh, Coffee Coffee not amazed to find he's a winner on the river. Saf now our short stack, and getting quite seriously short. He's down to six big blinds. Trying to buy it cheaply, and that was about as small a hand as he could expect to push off from Mardangle there. And now... Well, Madangle here might see this as a steal from Saf and fancy a re-raise. He might, he might do that, and the suitedness is enough here sometimes to swing it, because if you find out you are behind, at least you've got that extra 4.5% four, four or so, 4% more normally, to uh, get it you out of it. He figures he, he was, doesn't want to get involved right now. Ace, queen, ace, nine. Nice, Majesta. All in, yeah. You must say, um, can't, hmm, can't really call here. It's for half his stack. Is it really worth it with an ace, nine? No. Speaking of aces, I've just run that uh, poker calculation of the suited ace, king versus the offsuit, and it's pretty much where I said, which is 52.5 to 47.5% expectation. We're not really interested in split pots. We're interested in how much, on average, you make. Okay, so you were right, Doc. I'm not surprised. I wouldn't that. have said a word if I was wrong. Would you just? I don't think you would have. No. no. I don't think you'll catch me out. In fact, we should make this like a little competition. What catch Running me out? competition. You'll catch the Doc out. <laughs> not going to be that hard, is it? <laughs> and I'll just ask you really difficult questions about poker constantly. Ace King, good there. So, seven places left. A flop ripe for representation. No one's done it yet. And the jack going to be good. Yeah, and he knows it's a possibility. Checks it at the end. Safa on the mend. And uh, perfectly acceptable that there, in my opinion, from Posh, putting in eight big blinds with six players, and that's that's a critical point. If you're at a full table there of nine of ten people, I think that's unwise sticking uh, sticking in uh, eight big blinds with Ace Jack, but six handed, I think probably you've you've got to play it, and you may as well play it that way. Well, Ace King. Makes the bet, takes the aggression, and takes it down. So the three smaller stacks on the left and the bigger stacks on the right. East vs West. Now that can sometimes promote more action when that happens, because the small stacks of uh, 
in, when they're in late position, they, they're attacking each other, which is much easier for them to do. Everyone ganged up on me the other day because I was the other side of the table. Oh, really? Yeah. Now, oh, well. It does work like that, though. It's weird. Her ten's always nice. Coffee, coffee. Yeah, good bet. I make it a big bet there as well. I don't want some lone overcard coming in. Now, ten big blinds, jack ten off. I'm also going to fold that. I don't want to move all in with it. I don't want to commit some of my chips and then fold to a raise. What's that? Jack ten off under okay. the gun. Posh, likewise, can let this one go, I think. Fold, fold, fold. West Ham probably ahead now, going for the minimum rows again. And this has uh, worked before, it's going to work again. And Saf will be getting a bit cross about this, but he's not had the values to call with. Aces for coffee, coffee. Lovely. And that gets my dangle out of it, and Posh can fold. But might take a flop, actually. There is a danger. Whenever you see that minimum raise, worry about aces. Ooh. It is one possibility. That's a mad, mad, mad play for Seven, eight, nine. Nope. And what was he doing? There's been a raise and a re-raise. What on earth was he doing with a pair of sevens in that pot, Michelle? I don't know, Doc. I think he got a bit excited. Well, I think he did. I think he just got frustrated and thought, I'm short stacked, here we go. We're now seventh with $49.50. Six left to battle it out. Well, we've had an email from Darren who says, Hi guys, I would love to play against all those people who think you should have folded those pocket kings. To fold is crazy. That's from Darren. And uh, also one from Illy. He says, No brainer, cool Michelle, spot on. Only thing I would say is I'd have gone all in rather than bet the original 960 just to attempt just to attempt to ensure I'd only have one opponent or I'd simply pick up the blind. Yeah, I probably should have. I mean, my thinking was I actually wanted people to call me. <laughs> but I probably should have just stuck it all in. Yeah, because on a good day, if you stick it all in, you get a call from someone with two undercards. Yeah. But on a bad day, you get, you get three of them in and one of them's got the ace. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow, posh. The blinds have gone up, and he's sitting there with five and a half big blinds and moves with the pocket threes, praying not to get a call, of course. And Saf is the whipping, <coughs> whipping boy on this table. And look at that, his court uh, drips, and he can afford to slow play this, I think. No point getting heebie jeebies about the diamond draw. I think that's a waste. I really think that's a waste. He's put in a thousand when there's only about three or four thousand in the pot, and he's thrown away all his implied odds there. Ooh, queens for Jester. And with seven thousand in the pot, and Saf with only thirteen, the raise all in is absolutely correct. Make uh, any overcards in Saf's hand, ace or a king, pay to draw. Posh with the threes again, and he may do the, the same move. Yes, he does. And these two can't call, but uh, it's going to happen sooner rather than later, I think. With only seven big blinds, I suppose he has to keep making these pushes, doesn't he? He does, yeah. Sevens, oh dear, oh dear. I don't know if what's going on with Saf's very fortunate there, but he's got eight big blinds and he puts in two of them with a hand that. He doesn't want to take to a showdown. Saf should have gone all in. Posh, that's a bit small for me with the image that I've got if I'm posh. But who knows, he may get a call, not from Saf. And look at this, now Posh has got eight big blinds. 
And it's starting to get to the point where all-ins become a bit dangerous because they yeah. constitute too big a move for what you're going to win. Mm -hmm. No call. No. Certainly a raise as a bluff or a, or a fold. Power of little sixes there. Takes it down. Wow. Pair of kings, well, watch the jack queen, yep. Yeah, makes the raise. Minimum raise, though. Now, let's see what Coffee Coffee does. Does he want to play this for all his chips and go put himself into a chip lead, or does he want to play it safe? He wants to play it safe. Oh, it's cool. That's a lovely flop for the kings. Now I make it put in a small bet here, representing uh, someone like Ace King, Ace Queen, and I hope my opponent's got a pair and comes back at me, but he doesn't get action. Pair of nines for posh, no doubt he'll be sticking it in. Yep. And this is good because now he knows he might get called from a worse hand. Unfortunately, Coffee, I think, is going to call him with the Queen King here. Well, he's got him covered. So he can afford to. No, fold, not a bad fold. It, it looked like a pair or an ace. Mm -hmm. But some players would assume it posh has something like King Jack and would call with King Queen. Now the King 10 now can make the bet. And let's see if Saf cracks. Nope. Good fold. Ten Jack. What does Posh do with that one on the big blind? Yeah, he folds it if he's got any sense. He's been a... Yes, he does. Well done. And now Saf should be looking to move here. Oh, with only five big blinds, he's definitely struggling. A wide variety of hands are better all here. That's good enough for me if it's folded to me. I don't think it will be. Coffee, coffee will come in, but now he can fold. Hanging on in there, isn't he? Waiting for a hand. What's the difference between fifth and fourth? $79 to $94. OK. Well, yeah, I don't blame him for folding there. Jester can make a move. If Posh doesn't. Which I'm sure he won't with a 3-6. No, probably a bit small. And his reputation isn't too good at the moment. He's made a lot of all-ins. And maybe six, 7,000? Yeah, 7,000 it is. And Jester will be pleased there. Not to have company on a flop. Yeah, West Ham's starting to drift down as well now, and he'll be pleased with that pot. And Saf on the big blind. Oh, that's a hand he wants to raise with, not call with. If someone bets at him, he'll have to let it go. And Kathy Kathy will. But it's a fine hand to bet with, but not to call with. Ooh, he's limping. Ah, well. A bit tricky. King yeah. five's coming off the ride. OK. And now Saf has got his ten. He's got to go all in. He's a bit worried about Coffee's limp there. But, uh, oh, this is a dream. West Ham folded. Two pair West Ham folded, wasn't it? No. West Ham had five, six, sir. Eh? No, I don't think so. We'll never know. But it was very fortunate for Saf, I mean, to, to be led in there so cheaply. Threes for Posh, what does he do this time? Well, there's been a raise, so he can fold them. He's got no guarantee if he goes all in that Saf is going to fold, and in fact, to be honest, half is unlikely with the pot odds. It's important here before you make your re-raise that you calculate the pot odds your opponent will be facing. And, and then it's just too too long for Saf to fold. Oh, Saf's pretty tight, but he's called that one. Yeah. Ace, two, three, four, only five or three. Doesn't come, so Posh goes. Very bad move from Posh. You should have seen that Saf had to call. So fifth place, $79, 20 cents. Queen King in trouble here. Wow, just folds it. That's amazing. He's been programmed too by James Browning. So these little Browning bots going around the world. 
Can, can I do a bluff email while we're watching this? Because it's a bit of a long one. The email? OK. But it's our only bluff one for the whole night. All right, let's do it. It's from Petronius, who's Nick. Um, he says, I remember this bluff well, as, it only, as it's the only time I've seen seven players go to the river. It was in a 50 cent $1 cash game. I held the Jack Queen of Clubs. There was a call under the gun, a raise from the big blind, and seven of us saw the flop. King of spades, six Jack of hearts. I was in mid position. The first three players checked. So did I with my pair of jacks. The three players to my left checked. The turn came the Queen of hearts. Now I had jacks and queens, but there were possible made hands out there. The first player put in a small bet, which was called round to the last player, put in a small raise. Not very aggressive betting. I knew my two pairs were no good, but a house on the river could bring a big payout. The pot was now $56. The river was the ace of hearts. The first three players checked. I pushed in with $75 and took the pot down. Clearly, whoever had the king of hearts had the nuts, and I would have been in trouble if anybody actually had it. My reasoning was that if anyone did have the king of hearts, they would have bet on the flop. But the flop had been checked round. Not bad with 20 seconds thinking time. Yeah, great. Absolutely great bluff. Yeah? Brilliant bluff. Yeah. Well done, Petronius. Love it. Ah. Well done, Petronius. Good on you, Nick. Yeah, you don't, as long as you know no one else has got it, you don't have to have it yourself. They'll fold. Well done. You like that bluff? So Posh is gone. Saf is in good shape. And wow, I didn't expect to be see Saf as chip leader, I must say. Fold, fold, fold. Well, tempting pod odds, but West Ham decides no, and he is now getting very short indeed. He'll fold this one, I think. Chester should have a pop at Saf's big blind, he does. Mmm, just a call from coffee. It's interesting, in this stage, because everyone knows this is really raise or fold poker, a call can sometimes look so scary that people will just let you see the flop cheaply. So you can chuck in the odd call there, and that's what Coffee Coffee's done there. It's worked out very nicely for him. The others have been terrified by it, and the big blind has decided to give him the benefit of the doubt on the flop. Let's see if Jester keeps the pressure on West Ham. No. Oh, tempting to go all in here, and I think I probably would. I've got fold equity. There's 4,000 in the middle. Mm, yeah, could do. But what if you get re-raised, West Ham? You might have to call, because the pot odds are so long, and Coffee Coffee might just have two overcards. Good aggression from Saf. He's definitely uh, been waiting and waiting, and now he's found the time to start becoming the aggressor, making plays. There's uh, the end stages of, the, of a multi-table tournament, there's so much to play for because people think you can just get to the final table, but the first few paid places of a final table aren't actually that much, so you really have to try and get to top five, don't you? Yeah. <clears throat> You're looking to win it. West Ham will be pleased to get a walk there. Wow, Coffee Coffee called again. West Ham's caught the king. And uh, interesting there. He's only bet the pot. I think I'd probably go all in if I'm betting. Maybe hoping to induce a bluff, which he's intending to call, but nah, I'll probably move all in. Oh, Saf might fold this. Yes, he does. Oh, nice play from Coffee Coffee. Surely a bet from the 9-10 here. There it is, minimum raise. Just minimum. We've seen quite a few of those minimum raises, haven't we? Well, they got the idea off you, Michelle. They do, didn't they? Look how much it works. Ooh. Ooh. How does he play it? Like you say, the calls are looking a bit sus. Luckily, he's had a raise from the ace too. So he's just re-raised it to 10. Very dangerous raise there, because what you'll find is that an ace will call and abandon it on the flop if it doesn't catch. 
So you're giving the ace uh, a chance to draw to an ace on the flop, but they really won't give you any business if they don't catch because you've demonstrated strength before the flop. Mm, West Ham trying to get it cheap. This is something he did a long time ago against Staff, and it still seems to be working. I thought Staff maybe had adopted the mantle of an aggressor, but West Ham picks up a very cheap plot, uh, pot there. Well done. Blinds are going up to 153,000, that is. Huge. Huge. Flush draw now for Jester. Not a great one, but one all the same. Probably maybe just checked here. Yep. Nice walk. Especially with a three nine. Chester surely will attack West Ham here. Yes, he does. Standard three times big blind raise. West Ham releases. Coffee, coffee likewise. King nine off, not good enough to play back with. This is a one for West Ham, and he goes all in here. Coffee, coffee's called many, many times. There's no reason to suppose he's got a big hand. Saf can, uh, can fold, even if he thinks West Ham is just possibly behind. He doesn't know what coffee, coffee's got. And that's great for West Ham. And again. Ace King. Well, let's see how he plays it now. Because he's got uh, eight big blinds. And he's pretty much stated that he's prepared to go all in there. I think I prefer a complete all in, actually, rather than that, because a complete all in could be read as I don't really want to call. Whereas that kind of said, well, I do want to call. Call me if you will. Yeah. Two Ace Jacks. I think Jester and Kathy Kathy are going to be all in here. Jester raises and Coffee Coffee isolates him here with a, an all in. No. no, flat calls. Well, he's letting West Ham in. I don't think West Ham should call, but. Good odds if he gets that miracle straight. Yeah, it'd be wrong to draw to it. Mm. And now the heart will make all the difference. Yeah. Two over cards and a flush draw. Coffee oh, calls. Oh, Jester's going to double up. Yep. That is for sure. And there it is. That's oh, dear. Uh, unlucky for Coffee Coffee there. Just like the situation we saw earlier with, uh, I forgot the name of the player. but um, With he, the clubs? Yeah, with the clubs. It wasn't clubs at his end, but it was clubs when we saw it. Mm. Coffee Coffee goes all in. And uh, Saf, I think, will have to call. So it's going to go to a showdown. Saf will be facing very nice odds here. And what's with the dwell up? Oh, he's staying into the last. Oh well, Saf has done, brought it to the result it was always going to come to. Coffee, coffee calls. Got his 10. Yeah. Coffee's out. That was very abrupt, wasn't it? It was. Even the Queen wouldn't have helped. Nope. Okay, the fourth. Coffee Coffee went out with $94. So he did okay. And what are the remaining prizes? 123, 198, and 297. Hmm, okay. Lots of uh, back and forth here. Saf probably going to have to let it go now with a gut shot. Looks like Jester might have a hand. He's prepared to defend right to the end, which I'm sure he did there with top pair. And he's going to move again with ace eight. Four and a half in the middle. West Ham with 22. Yeah, I think that's a perfectly fine bet. He's making West Ham decide for all his chips. West Ham might well uh, move back at him with a worse ace. Now West Ham moves. And I stick it all in. Yeah. There's no raise I can find that I that I, I won't call if the, he re-raises me. Uh, I like difference. these little little raises instead of the pushs. And 
and again. All in this time. Yeah, I think he's done this the wrong way around, but takes it down. What a load of rubbish. Rubbish. Hello. Ooh. Hello. Now, if Saf plays it safe and goes all in, Jester can actually lay this down. But let's see. Ah. Ooh. Ooh. Saf let him have a flop. I mean, would Jester have called his all in? No, I don't think he'd have called his all in. He'd have read Saf for something better than Ace-10. Oh, now the ace is there. He's telling you he's got the ace, Saf. Yeah, Saf but knows now. You can't now. get away from it now with only 7,000. Wow, it's happening very quickly now. Very quickly. Saf takes $123. So still not bad. Ace king. Oh, great. West Ham has created a lovely situation. And now we must go all in. 30,000 in the pot. No point slow playing this any further. He's uh, letting Jester think he doesn't know if he's got anything. <laughs> Desperately trying to pretend, oh, I've got a little hand, I'm scared to raise the full amount. Jester knows he's well behind now. And he folds. He knows. Load of rubbish. Rubbish. Nope. Rubbish again. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Good bet, I like it. Now what? You've caught, you were bluffing, you are called, and now you've caught something on the flop. What do you do? Puts in a probing sort of bet, lovely. Creeping up slowly. It's a horrible situation where you go into it as a big stack in this heads-up situation and your opponent just seems to be slightly creeping up on you, taking more pots than you. Just to fight's back. Five, six, seven, and he sees six. And West Ham has... shot. I think West Ham plays this for all his chips. Yeah. He's got a gut shot, a pair. Jester may just be making a continuation bet there with overcards. That's exactly what West Ham's done. It's not his fault. And uh, Jester was fortunate to catch a pair against West Ham's player. Well, well West played. Ham takes $198 and Jester takes $297. So well done. Well played, boys. What did you think of that, Doc? Yeah, very good. Like the multi table, the final mm. table, good? Interesting good, good stuff. Play. Yeah. Well done, guys. And uh, we have an email here from 24 Ginger. And um, he says Hi, guys. I'm bouncing off the walls at the moment because I've won my first. I've had my first ever multi-table tournament win and my biggest ever payday. Well, you don't get quite the payout on the $2 sit-and-go tables. After two good results in the Poker Night Live members multi-table tournament, um, second two weeks ago, do you think I should play more of these or still stick to the sit-and-goes that um, I've been playing day after day? So there's 24 Ginger Jester. <clears throat> well, I don't know if it was that one. Oh. It's, it might have been a different one. Uh, yeah, well, whatever you're winning at at the <coughs> moment, um, play that until you're proven that it's, that it's shown to be only short-term variance. But yeah, I think you should. Okay, thank you, 24 Ginger. Um, we've got an email here from Johan, who says, Hi, Tom and Michelle. Michelle, just want to say you played the whole sit and go well, I think. Ah, oh, thanks, Johan. So fold isn't an option with kings at that point. You will win it often, and then you have a great chance of winning first prize. Fun playing with you, and you know I can't fold my monster hands. It's true, pair of You fives. watch it, Johan, because I'm after you. All right, Harren. Enough of your pushing me off with your fives. We will settle this score. Got an email from Zitty. Hey, Zitty. He says, hi. Zitty here. Enjoyed the Beat the Presenter tonight. Those people that suggested you should have folded the kings, what do they do when they want to cross the road? Even if they look both ways and it's clear, what about the chances that a jumbo jet may just <laughs> land on top of them? You'd never go out. Love the show. Keep it up. Whoa, double, double tops. <laughs> <laughs> Getting a hammering from everybody here. <laughs> 
Um, well, the, the, the tans, the bluffing that we were talking about earlier, it's, it's been wonderful. First of all, thank you very much for your emails, everybody. But we, we always say on Poker Night Live, everybody thinks bluffing is a huge part of poker, and it's really not. Um, but what guidelines can we give people when they're thinking about bluffing? Because it re it's really not as huge a part of the game as it needs to be, is it? Have a rough idea what your opponents have got. Have a rough idea what they think you've got. Don't bluff more than two players, and preferably only bluff one. Have outs. The more outs you have, the better. If you've got 15 outs, say you're drawing to an up and down straight draw and a flush draw, and you get yourself all in on the flop, in fact, you're, you're ahead against a top pair, say. Um, don't show your bluffs. Don't show your bluffs. Don't show your bluffs. You are killing the That's goose an important that lays point the golden you egg. That's important it three times. Yeah, no, it's because I don't really have enough time to fill the last three minutes. <laughs> no, I've got another question for you. Oh, have you? Yeah. Oh, okay, fine. Um, <laughs> Be aware of pot odds when you're bluffing. So basically, you, you want to try and take the pot cheaply, yeah, if possible. So there's a thousand in the pot. If you think that the guy will fold or call, uh, regardless of how much you put in, basically, if he's going to fold, he's going to fold, regardless of what you put in, or call, he's going to call, regardless of what you put in, make the bluff cheap. Put in 200 to win a thousand, not a thousand to win a thousand. Um, have I missed anything? I don't think so. I think that's everything. OK, if I think of anything more in the last two minutes, I'll uh, get back to you. What I was going to ask you is a question... Oh, one other thing, actually. Oh, well, yeah, sorry to interrupt you. When people start poker, they think that bluffing is nothing to do with maths and odds and any of that stuff. They think it's just a moment of pure genius where you put the chips in and you stare down your opponent and take a big pull on your cigar and say, you're going to call me, baby? That's wonderful. Thank you. In fact, I'm slightly excited. Can you do it again? <laughs> oh, I'll do it after the cameras have stopped rolling. <laughs> Um, but just like any other aspect of poker, <laughs> it's me again, uh, bluffing is um, you do it when you've analysed the situation and you think in the long run this is more likely to work than not work. Carry on, Michelle. Um, I was going to say about, because we touched for earlier on at the beginning of the night, we, we said about, we did. That was earlier. We said about um, learning to play the different types of games. Now I've been playing Texas Hold'em now for nearly a year, mm -hmm. yet I've never played any other form of poker. Is this something that I should be thinking about doing? I have no idea how to play Omaha or even Seven Card Start or any of the other things. Is it something I should be thinking about? And again, to our viewers, there are similar stages to me. Yeah, you should. Two reasons why you should learn uh, other forms of poker. One is that they're fun, and that's probably the best reason. But the second reason why you should learn them is that uh, one day in the very near future, you're going to find yourself in a dealer's choice game. Uh, certainly, if there are some of the more sort of the people who were playing poker before it became huge. And um, dealer's choice games tend to be looser and weaker and softer than Texas games. So you need to learn those, those forms of poker, seven card, Omaha, Irish, and the high-low games, so that when you're playing in the game you want to be playing in, the dealer's choice game, you're, you're not the mug. Yes, well, we found that out when I played Dr. Tom at a dealer's choice, and it was his idea to play dealer's choice, and when it got to his choice, it was some weird Welsh game that no one had ever heard of, <laughs> and of course he won. I don't know any Welsh games. Every hand we played. What was it, male voice choir competition? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that is all we've got to remember. That was that time when you called. I told you I had kings and you didn't believe me and called and lost. Yeah, we won't go to it. Oh, um, yes. it is the end of oh, the night. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's Dr. Tom and Night Nurse Special. It's been wonderful. Thank it's you, been Doc. Wonderful. I'm with you again on Thursday. Um, so join us on Thursday. <laughs> Do um, join us tomorrow night at 10 pm for plenty more poker action. Um, it's been a wonderful night. Thank you for all of your emails. Um, but that's it from Dr. Tom and the Night Nurse. Good night. So, good night. And goodbye. Oh, one other thing, I just remembered. <laughs>